Okay, live stream is up. PC recording done. Cloud is started. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Contracts. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Kalos, we are ready to begin. Thank you, are you ready to begin? Great. Yes, sir. Good afternoon and welcome to this hearing of the New York City Council's Committee on Contracts. Today is Monday, November 28th, 2021. It is 1 at 20 p.m. And my name is Ben Kalos and I have the privilege of chairing the Contracts Committee. For those of you watching remotely, please feel free to participate in this hearing by tweeting me at Ben Kalos with any comments or questions. I wanna thank council members Barron, Gennaro, and Joe and I for joining us today. As yet another variant of the COVID-19 virus threatens to extend this pandemic beyond the two year mark, we in government are coming to terms with how to handle this prolonged crisis while we in the city have managed to adjust reasonably well since the beginning in 2020, we are still dealing with how to manage the city's workforce of roughly 350,000 workers and countless city vendors who do contracted work for the city. The purpose of today's hearing is to address the altered contracting processes that we have encountered since Mayor de Blasio declared a state of emergency in March of 2020. In order to expedite the procurement process during the declared state of emergency, some layers of contract review were suspended in accordance with the state's procurement laws in order to achieve these goals more quickly. One example is my own office's work with EDC to leave no stone unturned in seeking PPE for the hospitals that I represent in the district. One contract that has come into question is the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications no-bid contract with IBM that started out at $43 million in May of 2020 that has now quintupled uh, by more than 400, by, by nearly 500% to $194 million. Uh, the last growth in contract of that scale would be city time. Our big question is whether the city can actually justify $200 million in work here as an emergency, given that this work is supposed to go through 2023. It's hard for me to imagine that anything that's going to be happening over the next two years into 2023 would still be an emergency. Sounds to me like a regular contract. Additionally, whether opening the work up to city employees and competitive bidding could help save hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer dollars, after all, if you're watching this and you live in New York City, you're paying taxes. The primary role of the state's procurement law is to, quote, guard against favoritism, improvidence, extravagance, fraud, and corruption, and to foster honest competition in order that the local government may obtain the best goods and services at the lowest possible price to protect the public's uh, uh, fiscally. While we on the committee understand that the initial contract with IBM was conducted in accordance with these laws, we are uneasy about certain additional components and whether they indeed do protect the public uh, fiscally uh, by obtaining the best goods and services at the lowest possible price. Before I turn it over to do it, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Contracts Committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Leah Skripiak, and Finance Unit Head John Russell for all their work as well as Adam Bermudez, my legislative director, for helping put this hearing together. With that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Committee Counsel Alex Ponoff, to go over some procedural items and swear in, uh, do it, and Mayor's Office of Contract Services. Thank you, Chair Kalos. I'm Alex Polinoff, Counsel to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Uh, before we begin testimony, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called upon to testify at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify individually, so please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be the Associate Commissioner of Procurement and Vendor Management from the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, Robert Abulafia. 
The Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs and Communications, Robin Levine, will also be available for questioning. The second panelist to give testimony will be the Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, Victor Olds, and First Deputy Director Ryan Murray will be available for questioning as well. I will call on each of you shortly when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. And please note that for the ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chair. Uh, before we begin, uh, as a reminder, all hearing participants should submit their written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov no later than 72 hours after the hearing. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. To all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions today, please raise your right hands and I will call on you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Associate Commissioner Abulafia. Yes. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Levine. Yes. Director Olds. Yes. First Deputy Director Murray. Yes. Thank you all. Uh, Associate Commissioner Abulafia, you may begin your testimony. Chair Kalos and members of the Committee on Contracts. My name is Robert Abulafia, and I am the Associate Commissioner for Procurement and Vendor Management, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, also known as DUIT. I previously served as the agency's Chief Contracting Officer, and I now oversee that function. Joining me is my colleague, Robin Levine, who is DUIT's Assistant Commissioner for Communications and External Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about DUIT's emergency procurements. In advance of today's hearing, at the chair's request, DUIT produced the International Business Machines IBM Emergency Contract for Review. The production included the original contract entered into May 1st, 2020, the 36 work orders that had been authorized under the contract, each of which contains descriptions of the services required to be rendered under the work order. All invoices billed to date against the contract. In total, do it produce more than 1800 pages of contractual documents, all of which show a dogged adherence, not only to the emergency contracting process, but to best practices for contractual management and integrity in the city of New York. Indeed, as you will hear more about later in the testimony, although the emergency contracting process gave agencies great latitude, Commissioner Tisch was insistent that the rates and terms included in the emergency contract be consistent with the rates and terms previously negotiated in a similar systems integrator contract with IBM, which was approved through the non-emergency standard procurement process and signed off on by no fewer oversights than the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, the Office of Management and Budget, the Financial Control Board, the Law Department, the Department of Finance, the Department of Investigation, and the Controller. I am happy to offer the committee context as to the need for this contract, as well as how we established it and managed IBM's work on the city's behalf why we needed an emergency contract. The city established an emergency contract with IBM in May 2020 at a time of unprecedented demand for IT resources and on the city's existing IT infrastructure. As my commissioner stated in her preliminary budget testimony this past March, the COVID-19 pandemic brought technology to the forefront of so many of the city's services both for the public and internal to the city's workforce. The scale, range, and breadth of the city's technology needs during the pandemic exceeds by orders of magnitude any burden previously placed on civic technology. But do it enter the pandemic 
with severe disadvantages to meet these demands, such as a significant headcount shortage, both from attrition and years of limited hiring due to hiring freezes, and an aging technology infrastructure that had to work or else critical systems that New Yorkers and the city relied upon, like 311, would fail. Despite these odds, Duet kicked into high gear to tackle the demands of the pandemic, and the staff at Duet, with support from a number of vendors, including IBM, Salesforce, Uncork, Microsoft, Apple, Esri, T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, to name a few, accomplished a tremendous amount such as flipping much of the city's workforce from an on-site to a remote work model, developing the city's vaccination and contract tracing systems, launching the city's first online marriage license platform, building the Get Food program, and procuring and administering half a million internet-connected iPads for public school students. And the results speak for themselves. More than 300 million meals delivered to food insecure New Yorkers through the Get Food platform, 27.4 million hits on Vaccine Finder, nearly 24 million calls processed through the 311 system in 2020 alone, 3 million vaccination appointments processed through Vax for NYC, more than 1 million cases and contacts processed through the contact tracing system, more than 1 million downloads of the NYC COVID Safe app, half a million New York City public school children doing schoolwork remotely during the darkest days of the pandemic on city-issued iPads, $400,100 incentives claimed by New Yorkers through the vaccine incentive portal, and tens of thousands of city employees who accessed city systems remotely. All this to say nothing of the hundreds of thousands of remote family visits for the incarcerated, virtual arraignments processed, and nearly 40,000 virtual marriage licenses issued. As it relates to the IBM contract specifically, the combination of the stresses placed on the city's IT infrastructure, limited staffing, and the speed with which we needed to respond to changing circumstances required do it to procure services from a mature, multifaceted technology company that could quickly adapt to and augment what do it was already doing. The city recognized early on that meeting the pandemic's demands head on meant securing the aid of assistance integrator through the emergency procurement process established under Emergency Executive Order 101. DOIT assessed that a successful systems integrator must have multiple skill sets across many disciplines, including, but not limited to, application development, application management, data architecture, preventative maintenance, networking and security oh. services, knowledge of existing infrastructure, and IT systems and the ability to integrate a variety of needed tools and solutions, competitive rates that fall within industry standards, a track record of operating in good faith and ensuring the city of New York was prioritized, and most importantly, available resources that could be rapidly mobilized and deployed. Based on DOIT's assessment of these criteria, we established the Emergency Technical Support Services contract with IBM in May 2020, the basis for, for the contract. To be clear, this contract was not developed in a vacuum. As I mentioned above, although agencies were given a wide range of latitude under the city's emergency contract authority, do it exercised very little of it in entering into the IBM contract. DOIT has a rock solid basis thanks to the existing pre pandemic systems integrator agreement that the city holds with IBM. That agreement was reached through a rigorous open competitive request for proposals process, vetted on all fronts, and approved and registered by the city oversights, including the controller in 2014. 
During the open competitive RFP process, IBM's proposal was reviewed by a panel of technical experts who evaluated IBM's submission based on several criteria, which include demonstrated quantity and quality of relevant experience, demonstrated level of organizational capability, and approach and methodology. The hourly rates were compared to industry standard rates for similar services to ensure fair and reasonable pricing for the city. The terms and conditions established were carefully negotiated and continue to be viewed as extremely beneficial to the city. By basing the emergency contract on the existing, existing systems integrator agreement, do it ensure that the city would not be overcharged for services provided by IBM. And in keeping with the requirements for emergency procurements under Executive Order 101, do it obtain New York City Law Department approval for the emergency contract as the form and submitted all required documentation to the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. We did everything by the book and we continue to support the city in no small thanks to this emergency contract through a dark time that continues on today. Safeguards and integrity. When DOIT established the emergency contract, we did so with an understanding that the highest order of contract management and program oversight was required. To that end, all work done under the contract is authorized in the form of a work order, 36 of which were produced prior to this hearing. Each work order sets out the total cost allowed for work, the deliverables required, the, res the resources to be utilized, and the number of hours allowed. Work orders are reviewed and approved by multiple DOIT divisions, including DOIT's chief operating officer, the technical program manager, the chief financial officer's team, and the deputy commissioner for management and budgets team. The deputy commissioner for management and budget is the final sign off on all work orders. Regular project management meetings to review cost and vendor performance are held by DOIT's chief operating officer, the DOIT technical lead on the program. The chief financial officer and the deputy commissioner for management and budgets offices. DOIT's audits and accounts team is also required to hold regular meetings to review spending on the contract that tracks back to work orders and deliverables signed off on by the DOIT technical leads and the deputy commissioner for management and budget. This management structure ensures that one, the city is receiving the highest level of service from IBM, and two, all aspects of work performed under the contract are fully documented and reviewable. The contract's basics. Lastly, I'd like to offer a few basics on the contract and its current value. The emergency contract was initially established for one year with a maximum spend allowed of up to $43.7 million. Included in the contract's term was a one-year extension option with a maximum spend allowed of up to $27.7 million, which we exercised in February 2021. In 2021, when it was clear that the, the demands on the city were no less than 2020, the IBM contract was amended again to extend its terms through April 2023 with an additional maximum spend allowed of $122.4 million. The contract's maximum spend total currently sits at $193 million, which builds in flexibility for the city to tackle unexpected challenges that arise from the continuing unpredictable situation presented by the pandemic. The maximum spend values for the contract that I mentioned are the spending ceiling under the contract. The city may spend up to the contract's total but that does not mean the city actually will spend the full amount. For example, under the contract's first year, the city spent 1 million less than the 43.7 million ceiling. Do its robust contract management is a safeguard against excessive and unnecessary spending under the agreement. I'm also proud to note that do it incorporated an MWBE subcontracting goal in the second amendment to the emergency contract 
which extends to the contract's 2023 end date. With that, I would like to conclude my prepared testimony. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, Chair Palos, and I am happy to take any questions. Uh, we're going to hear from Mayor's Office of Contract Services next, but first piece, uh, Associate Commissioner, were you given an opportunity to do a sound check before we started? Yes, were you not able to hear me, uh, Council Member? Uh, your, your audio went in and out. So while Mayor's Office of Contract Services is uh, testifying, if you can take an opportunity, whether it's logging in from your phone or another device or working with the uh, Department of Information Technology to make sure that the audio is not fading in and out, uh, that would be amazing. And then the other part is during this hearing, we will be making reference to the statements of works. Uh, one, two, and six are in one file. Uh, that was provided that is 680 pages long and five, three, four, five, seven, and eight are in another file that was provided that's 460 pages long. Uh, we would love to be able to screen share, but uh, the materials are not provided in an accessible format and therefore we cannot share them uh, because there is a segment of the population that would not be able to access them, uh, particularly because they are password protected. So if you could please have them, we will be making uh, reference and please get the audio fixed. We will now turn it over to uh, uh, Victor Olds. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Victor O. Olds and I serve as the director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. I am joining the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications Services. We testified about New York City's valiant efforts to source personal protective equipment for our heroic frontline workers in October of 2020. We all acknowledge the COVID-19 pandemic required extraordinary contributions in all areas of life. This need extended to strengthening and securing our IT infrastructure and services during a time where the world began to operate digitally by default. Under emergency executive order 101, the mayor allowed modification of the city's procurement rules enabling agencies to fast track purchases of goods or services necessary to combat the crisis. Each agency was required to confirm contracts were necessary to respond to the pandemic. Multiple oversight approvals were required for all emergency contracts and MOCs coordinated with city partners holding regular meetings with the controller's office to keep them aware of upcoming contracts and processing. Any change to a contract followed a similar process requiring documentation to be compiled for review, and this information was made available to the controller's office as well. To comply with local law, MOX also coordinates with agencies to report increases in capital contracts to the New York City Council pursuant to local law 18 of 2012. The do it contract in question today was reported in accordance with that law. Thank you for inviting us to testify today. I am joined by Ryan A. Murray, first deputy director at MOX, and we're happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. I think most of our questions are going to be for do it, but if you happen to have any knowledge, we're happy to have you. Uh, Associate Commissioner, were you able to get the audio working or bring in a different device? Hi, council member. I'm so sorry about that. So what we're going to do is we're just moving to a different computer. It'll take like a minute, but we did a sound check on the other computer. We just want to resolve your audio issues. So I'm sorry about that. We'll be back in a moment. Okay, we will uh, recess for a couple of moments.
Uh, just checking in, another tool that we have used if the microphone isn't working is dialing in on a phone. If you select the microphone, the up carrot, uh, you can change the microphone from the system microphone to uh, phone audio. Just checking in with Do It about getting on the Zoom and getting the audio working. Can you hear me now? Much better. Okay, great. Excellent. Uh, Chair, before we begin questioning, I just like to remind the other members of the administration to try and keep their mics. Uh, unmuted during the question and answer period. Just makes it easier going back and forth. Uh, <clears throat> in your uh, testimony, Associate Assistant Commissioner, uh, uh, what was the uh, original total contract worth? Just bear with me one second, Council Member. Was it $43.7 million? That is correct. Uh, in your testimony, you indicated you, you actually spent $1 million less. Yes, council member, that is correct. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, choice to expend, extend the contract uh, to, and increase it uh, by $27.7 million? And what, were, what was the time you were extending the contract to? So the first contract, what were the original contracts start and end dates? Thank you for that question, council member. Uh, amendment number two, dated February 12th, 2021, extended the term of the contract through April 30th, 2022, and increased the contract maximum by 27.7 million. Since the pandemic and resulting effects wait, were wait, on let's the let's just stick on that. So you increased it from forty three million to seventy million. Uh, how much money have you spent on the contract to date? I believe the answer to that is uh, approximately uh, sixty million has been spent um, uh, under the contract. Checkbook NYC is showing that your current spent to date is 52.9 million, uh, with the uh, last payment being made on November 23rd of uh, half a million dollars, and in the month of November, about uh, 1.3 million. Uh, sorry, not even uh, about three or four million. Uh, do you know why there's a discrepancy between the number you have versus what we have in our own records and what is available on Checkbook NYC? 
So the, um, the numbers uh, that, that we provided um, are from the city's financial management system, uh, which is a real time uh, accounting. Uh, maybe checkbook has not ca uh, caught up yet to, to that information. Got it. And so you still have uh, another $10 million to spend before April. Is that correct? Uh, the, the current contract amount is a hundred and sorry, just bear with me for one sec. 193.8 million. Are you um, planning to that, that 193 million? That's your budget until what year? That account. Good question. Council member. That is the, um, the, the agreement goes through April 30th, 2023. So how much money are you planning to spend? So you've spent 60 million. You have um, 193 that you can spend. So you've got 133 million left. Are you planning to spend all of it before April? Or are you planning to stick with the original $71 million figure for April, 2022? I believe that the, um, the total of the work orders provided to your office was approximately $90 million. So there's going to be another $30 million in spending between when and when. So again, work is only uh, granted through a, a work order to the approved work order to the contract. So, you know, as the work orders are finalized, that money is set aside under the contract. So uh, you, your office should have um, what is most current uh, as of now under the contract. So, $30 million is what you've got left to spend under the work orders. We, we would have to get back to you on that. We could come, we could give you a, a, a more accurate number. How long does it take you to put something out to bid? Council member, are you referring to the city's uh, request for proposal process? Actually, let, let's rewind a little bit. Um, was the IBM contract a no bid contract? Okay, good question, council member. In accordance with the established uh, emergency procurement process set forth on, under emergency executive order 101 issued by the mayor, Dewitt made the determination to contract with International Business Machines Corporation, IBM, for these technical support services. Dewitt submitted its determination to the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the New York City Law Department as instructed to obtain the required written approval from each agency in accordance with the requirements of the emergency executive order. In accordance with the established process, Dewitt subsequently obtained New York City Law Department approval of the contract as the form and submitted all required documentation to the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, MOX, for registration of the contract in the city's financial management system. Lots of words there. Was it a no bid question, contract, yes or no? The contract that was established complied with the emergency executive order process. Okay, I'll, th I'll throw it over to Mox, who, who might be more familiar with the terms of art, but uh, if you guys want to, to answer that one, do you, do you know of this contract? Uh, the contract number uh, is CT1858202124529. Do you know if it was a no bid contract? Thank you, Councilmember Kalis. I can speak generally to the process. I don't. I don't think I'll be able to look up that contract for you right now. Pursuant to the emergency executive order, agencies were required to use as much competition as was reasonable under the circumstances. So uh, I think Do It will have to let you know what that was, whether they went directly to IBM because they had a pre-existing relationship and knew that they'd be able to do the services that were needed, you know, in, on an expedited basis, or if they went out to uh, multiple vendors and and uh, and you know evaluated 
their proposals. Um, I'll let you know that in, in most instances, agencies, especially at the start of the pandemic, went to those vendors that they knew could provide the services immediately, given the you know urgency of the situation and the uh, the unprecedented circumstances that the city was facing. I am frustrated by the fact that neither do it nor Mox wants to just give me a yes or a no. Uh, in response to our first uh, document request, uh, we asked whether or not, uh, so, so I'll, I'll try asking a different way. Uh, were there any other bids on this contract? Uh, so, council member, I also, sorry, Robert, no I wanted to refer back to my colleague's testimony um, where he noted that, um, you know, while agencies were given, you know, a lot of latitude under the city's emergency contract authority, we actually had to use very little of it because we were able to leverage um, our existing pre-pandemic systems integration agreement with IBM, which we use as the framework. For this, and I, I do want to remind you, Council Member, um, for context here, that I that that original IBM contract was reached through, you know, an open competitive RFP that had been vetted and approved by all of the all the city's oversight entities back in back in 2014. So we were we were going back, we were using that as a as a framework. I, I wanted to provide that context. So no one was able to bid on this $200 million contract. It was just given to IBM. Is that I correct? Do, uh, I, I do also want to note that at the height of the pandemic, you know, I don't need to tell you that the city was facing an unprecedented and we were looking to move swiftly and uh, do it was tasked with tremendous COVID response. And so it was very important for the COVID response that we were able to get something in place very quickly so that we could quickly adapt to the, um, to the like I said, the unprecedented and the unprecedented, you know, unpredictable needs that the pandemic has brought on. T tell me about uh, when you decided to extend the uh, contract by $122 million. When was that in the pandemic? That was at the height of the pandemic in, in March of 2020 that you put out the 193 million or, or when did that extra 122 million pop up? So uh, thank you for that question, council member. Um, amendment number six uh, dated June 25th, 2021, extended the term of the contract through April 30th, 2023 and increase the contract maximum by 122.4 million, bringing the contract total to 193.9 million. Uh, Assistant Commissioner, did you have your vaccine by June 25th, 2021? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, me, me too. Uh, so when, when you put out a $122 million uh, contract, uh, was that, would you characterize that as at the height of the pandemic? So the $122 million was really uh, an extension of the existing work that had not been completed yet to address the pandemic. Uh, was, it, was it work that was an okay. in emergency in nature? Yes, that is correct. And, and you believe that um, between March of 2020 and April of 2023, you could not go through the regular procurement process for any of these, uh, anything that you've given to IBM. Thank you for that uh, question, council member. Um, as mentioned previously, um, you know, we entered into this emergency contract in accordance with executive Emergency Executive Order 101 and the services um, fall within On, on June 25th, 2021, was Governor Cuomo's uh, emergency orders still in effect or had he begun to roll back his emergency orders? 
I do, I do want to be clear, um, council member, I, I, the pandemic certainly was still underway in June. I mean, the pandemic is it's still underway today. We got Omicron. No arguments here. It's just uh, a question of just um, Governor Cuomo had already rolled back his emergency orders. So uh, I guess what's the status of uh, Mayor de Blasio's? There's been so much focus on the governor. Uh, has Mayor de Blasio rolled back his executive orders? Uh, I'll ask that to, to Victor Olds at Vox. Thanks. Sorry, Councilman. I have to mute and unmute. There's some background noise here, and I don't want to disturb the hearing. But yes, uh, the the city's emergency executive order was rolled back uh, at, at some point in either July or August. I don't remember the exact date, but it was at some point over the summer. Great. So can we rebid this $123 million uh, since we have until 2023 to get this work done? Since there's no more emergency procurement. Well, council member, the, the emergency executive order authority granted pursuant to emergency executive order 101 uh, was rescinded uh, in July or August, but it, but it doesn't mean that all the contracts that were let pursuant to that emergency executive order are terminated upon you know the the end of the emergency executive order. There are several contracts that are still underway that the city entered into during that time that are still in good use and that we need to respond to the ongoing pandemic, as you mentioned. This $122 million that was entered into on June 25th, 2021, after all of us already had our vaccines, is three times larger than the original $43 million no-bid contract. And so I'm just asking whether or not uh, we could save money, my money, your money, taxpayer money, by seeing what the private sector could do, whether or not anyone else on the planet could do this work. Is IBM the only company on this planet who can do this work? Council member, I certainly appreciate that question, but I, I do wanna make clear that the full RFP process takes an entire year. By that time, the, the, the contract would be up, but also to your point, the, the pandemic- it wouldn't be up. You, you would still have more time on this. This is, we're talking about 2023. And, My three-year-old daughter will be five. And again, I just want to note that uh, the full RFP process would take, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. We are still working on critical COVID-related work. And as I said earlier, uh, one of the benefits of this contract is really that we're able to, we were able to work quickly we're able to respond to sort of unpredictable, unprecedented needs for the city. And our response um, since March and every day since then has just been making sure that we have the flexibility in place that we need to uh, protect the city's IT assets and, and ensure continuity in all services and also just respond to everything that keeps coming up. So just, just so you know, these were the easy questions. These were the softball questions. Uh, I, I actually have real questions coming up. The fact that I can't get a straight answer. So um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. This was a no bid contract to IBM. There were no other bidders. Tell me I'm wrong. Uh, it was no bid, but it was bidded out based on, on the- Robin, gold, gold, good. No bid, we're good, we're on the same page. Thank you. Um, that was just that we just spent 15, 20 minutes just trying to get somebody to answer that straightly. So that is amazing. Um, I am I am privileged to get to serve with council member Inez Barron and uh, she, she is a hallmark of integrity uh, and uh, I do not wanna keep her waiting. I'm gonna have a lot of questions. She is welcome to jump in with as many rounds of questions as she wants and intermingle. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Inez Barron. She will, she and my other colleagues will have a five minute clock, but uh, happy to have her jump in as often as she wishes. And did we just lose her? No, I'm here. Perfect. All you. Great. Uh, thank you to the chair for hosting this hearing and thank you to the panel for coming. It always amazes me when city agencies are asked direct questions about a topic that they know they will be questioned about 
and they come with this obfuscation of answers. It would seem to me that we would have some kind of log and some kind of tracking that would readily identify which contracts are no bid and which contracts are not. But yet, as the chair has indicated, for like the last 20 minutes, we couldn't get a direct answer. And it always makes me wonder, well, why can't they just come and say, yes, it's a no bid contract, but this is why we, it became a no bid contract. It was only towards the end of this exchange that I heard, well, an RFP takes at least a year and that extends the process. So I'm always suspicious. Why can't they just answer the question? Why can't they just say yes or no and then explain why that was the case? So uh, just to echo what was said, tell us yes or no, and then you can give us the, the context or the background as to why it is that uh, it happened. Um, so it doesn't build confidence. It makes us think that there's something else going on when we can't get a direct answer. So it, what, it, I bring the question, do you have contracts? How do we differentiate the contracts that the city enters into? Do we keep one set for no bid contracts and another set for contracts that are given based on an emergency basis or whatever the requirements are? Or are they all intermingled with perhaps a column, a check off column for us to know which type of contract it is. So that way you can give us a direct answer when we ask for one. So how do we keep a record of the types of contracts which the city offers? I'm happy to take that question, Councilmember nice Barron. Good to see you. <clears throat> Likewise, nice to see you also. Uh, and I, I apologize if there was any confusion with respect to the first question. Uh, I think that there were a couple of things that were- I don't think it was confusion. I think it was obfuscation, just not a direct answer. I understand. I, I'd like to help clear that up, I guess, by answering okay. this question that, that, you, that you've just asked us now, because I don't, I don't think that there is anything to hide here. And I, I think that we can be very direct and clear with you, hopefully. Uh, you. So pursuant to the mayor's emergency executive order 101, uh, certain procurement rules were suspended, namely chapter 13 of the charter, also the procurement policy board rules and various provisions of the city's administrative code. Uh, what we had to do as a result of that was we had to put in some sort of mechanism for agencies to follow to know how to go about the contracting process uh, in response to COVID. So there are certain measures that we put in place. One was that every agency head was required to write a memo to both MOX and the law department outlining how the contract was in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. That that was reviewed. They were required to confirm that there was funding that was available for every contract. MOX had daily at the beginning of the pandemic, and then we transitioned to several times per week meetings with the controller's office to keep them aware of every contract that was being registered. And then we also, um, prior to registering each contract, had those communications. And then every contract that has been registered uh, pursuant to the emergency executive order is available in checkbook. NYC. So you can see the full gamut of all the contracts that the city has entered into. You can see the dollar values for each of those contracts. There's nothing that is not publicly available with respect to the emergency contracts that were entered into by the city. And we had a hearing on this with um, Chair Kalos last year to talk about the city's emergency response efforts. And we are by and large proud of the way that we were able to respond to the city's pandemic. And I think that it, it's, uh, it, it's a huge success story um, in the city's being able to rally and support the frontline workers and also manage the you know almost instantaneous telework accommodations that were needed to be set up and to continue to keep the city up and running and moving. Um, so all that information is publicly available. Each of the contracts that were let pursuant to the emergency executive order are emergency contracts that are delineated within checkbook. And we have a running list that we can provide you with if you, if you ever want to see them in a different format. Happy to share that with you. We have the date that the contract was registered. We have the dollar value for the contract. We have the agency and the description of each of the services. So I assure you that there is uh, a wealth of, of knowledge that we are able to provide you with and, and uh, that is already publicly available, but happy to pass it along as well. Great, thank you for that. Uh, and yes, I'd love to see that, uh, so we can ask for that. I have a, two other quick questions, yes? I was gonna jump into the issue we were okay. discussing, but go for your two questions. Okay, great. One question is about the uh, contract that the city has with uh, um, 
the statue for victory, which is going to replace uh, the Sim statue that was on Central Park East, Fifth Avenue, Fifth, Fifth Avenue. And the contract has not, the contract was for a million dollars when it was announced. But then at some point there was a fee that was subtracted from this million dollar contract, uh, a fee of $225,000 for some type of management. Is that the standard practice that when an artist is offered a, or receives a contract from the city that uh, a quarter of it, almost a quarter of it is given to EDC to, to manage that? Uh, I'd, I'd love to get more information hey, and back to you with the specifics of that council member. I, 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 I don't have that contract in front of me here and, and probably- Well, it hasn't been you. signed because the, yeah. the artist is wondering, wait a minute, what happened to a quarter of my contract? It was listed for a million, but if you can get back to me, that would be, that would be great, thank you. Yeah. Council, and, and yes, last, council member, this is- Yes. We, uh, we've been in touch with your office and uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs, I believe. Uh -huh. uh, their commissioner reached out to uh, your team formally in a response to this inquiry. Happy to follow up once more with uh, your, your staff person. Uh, they're working with EDC and the artists. We're familiar with this, EDC, um, yeah. but the process, the pr yeah, the process seems familiar and consistent, but uh, we do have the inquiry in from your team and there's a, a response that's been sent back. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And lastly, where are we with contracts for MWBEs? Where are we at? What, what's our goal? What's been our accomplishment? What, what targets have we set? What have we reached? And how are we still expend, extending that to expand it to other groups? Sure. Uh, happy to give you a brief overview of the city's uh, progress to date. As you know, the MWBE efforts within the administration are led by the mayor's office of MWBE. Um, we have made significant gains since the beginning of the de Blasio administration. I remember uh, starting work on the MWBE program shortly after I came to MOX, and I think the city's uh, overall utilization percentages were certainly in the, in the single digits. I think it was maybe 7% or mm -hmm. maybe 8%. And uh, within the, the time of the de Blasio administration, the, those numbers have neared 30%. I think we were at maybe 28% last year and the final numbers for this year might be 26 or 27 percent uh, i'd have to look but i mean significant strides have been made the program has expanded i was personally involved with legislation to amend the procurement policy board rules to allow for purchases to be made directly to mwbes without competition up to five hundred thousand dollars the rule previously allowed for purchases up to twenty thousand dollars for goods and services and thirty five thousand dollars for construction and so you can only imagine the significant increase that we've had in purchases uh, without competition to MWBEs, although uh, one of the safeguards that's been put in place is ensuring that at least three quotes are received. So there is still responsibility that's worked into the progress. There are a lot of measures that we have undertaken to ensure that we are including our MWBE partners. Also, Mayor de Blasio uh, issued executive order, I believe it's 59, during the course of the pandemic, uh, requiring agencies to ensure that they were looking at MWBE goals for these emergency contracts and not uh, excluding MWBE would-be partners in terms of subcontracting, as would be the case with normal contracting. So the city has made significant gains in its MWBE utilization, uh, and we continue to be proud of not just the rules and laws that we have rewritten, but the actual progress that we've seen in city contracting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, first I want to acknowledge you've been joined by Council Member Helen Rosenthal and uh, to the extent that Council Member Barron is interested in tag teaming with me on this one, what were the original MWBE requirements under this no bid contract with IBM and have they changed at all over the course of the six amendments? <clears throat> Thank you for that question, uh, Council Member. Uh, the original emergency agreement uh, did not include an MWB subcontracting goal. However, uh, under amendment number two, um, an, M an MWBE subcontracting goal of 15% of the overall uh, contract value was, was added to the contract. Now, you've already made payments on this. So uh, you've paid out uh, $60 million according to your testimony. So, um, how much of that went to MWBEs? 
That is a good question. That is something that we track on a regular basis. Um, we are working with the Department of Small Business Services um, to uh, certify partners um, that are eligible. Um, and I, I believe to date, um, we have uh, attained approximately 10 to 11 percent uh, compliance, um, and that number is continuing to go up. On this contract, you have 10 percent of the contract, so you spent six million dollars on MWBs. Is that your testimony? Uh, we could we could get you a, an actual number, but that is a ballpark. Uh, I'm, I'm going to direct you to, and anyone watching, uh, to checkbooknyc.com slash contract underscore details slash AGID slash 5985991 slash doc type slash CT1. According to that form, it says that um, there is only seven subcontractors on this contract is IBM and MWBE. No. Okay. Uh, according to Checkbook NYC, the URL I read into the record, there are seven sub vendors. Is, is Checkbook NYC correct that there are seven vendors, sub vendors? That sounds accurate, yes. Uh, Checkbook NYC says that's $8 million. That has gone to sub vendors. Wow. Of those sub vendors, each of them have $1 million and $2 million contracts. And only two of the seven vendors appear are, are labeled as MWBE. Uh, five of them are labeled non MWBE and two of them are labeled Asian American uh, MWBE for a total of $2 million. Uh, so according to Checkbook NYC, you, you have fallen far short of the $9 million, uh, you are at $2 million. So yeah, it could, it could very well it, be. I'm going to turn that. it back over to Council Member Barron, whose uh, nonverbals indicate she may have something to say, and if we can turn the clock back up. So, so just to add to that, Council Member, we will get you the final accurate numbers, and I don't think it's consistent with what you're seeing in checkbook. Uh, Thank you, Mr. The, Chair. Uh, uh, so sorry, before, before Council Member Barron. Uh, the great thing is this is an online hearing. You have several hundred employees. So get us the numbers now or let Checkbook NYC speak for the record. Uh, we had wanted to do a screen share because I am completely done with gaslighting and being told that the information that is publicly available is inaccurate because if I have to choose between whether do it's lying, on, lying under oath or Checkbook NYC is lying, I'm going to think that uh, it's the person in front of me. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Barron to uh, continue the MWBE line of questioning. Uh, thank you. Mr. Time Chair. starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm concerned that there's such a discrepancy. And again, it brings me to my point about preparation for any hearing where you know the topic and you know the direction and you know where the um, focus is going to be that you're not prepared. You know, I, I taught for many, many years and it would be similar to a student coming at the, uh, for a term project or a presentation and not having the essence of what it is that's required. Uh, so my question is the information that you just gave to us, where did you get that from? And why is it so disparate? and distant and different from what is the public information? That is an excellent question, council member. Um, we track the MWBE subcontracting under this contract very closely. It is a high priority item for this agency and we work with IBM on a weekly basis to track that information. Uh, they may not be current with entering their payments into the payee information portal which links uh, to uh, FMS and, and to checkbook. Um, so we will make sure that we provide the council members with the most accurate information possible. Um, but again, we do track this information on a regular basis and we, we internally have the most accurate numbers and we would not go by what's in checkbook. Oh, so uh, then it, we can expect then that as, as you 
look at checkbook, you can see, oh, they've forgotten to make this entry or this is not a current entry. So how, how, how long a time, how long a period of time does it take for you to update what's in checkbook so that we will know that it's an accurate reflection? Could that be by the end of today or tomorrow? How, what, how long is that process for you to make sure that what's in checkbook is current and updated? Uh, council members, uh, I do appreciate you bringing this issue to our attention. I can guarantee you that after this hearing, we will be following up with our colleagues. Um, of course, we want to make sure that the council has the most accurate information, but of course, we also want to make sure that Checkbook NYC reflects the same numbers. So, of course, everyone is looking at the same information. So, certainly, we will be following up. Following you you up. mentioned the 15% so in your question, testimony. Right. So, just to follow up quickly, Mr. Chair, this is a kind of answer that's a non answer. My question was how long a period of time do you think it would take to make the information in checkbook current and accurate? But I didn't get an answer. And that's a part of what I'm talking about when council members ask questions. That to me was a, a, an evasive response. Oh, we're going to make sure. But it didn't say, oh, it'll take us 24 hours or 48 hours, or we need five days. I mean, do you do you have a time period that you operate in? Or do you not have a time period? You just do it when you get to it. So council member, just to be clear, um, IBM is responsible for entering the, the payments into the okay. city's pay information portal. And we will work with them to ensure that the information is current. So if, <laughs> IBM, if IBM is responsible, how do you then have different information from what's in checkbook? IBM sent it to you and not to checkbook? As I mentioned previously, uh, council member, we work with IBM on a regular basis. Um, it, it, is, it is very possible that IBM has not uh, updated their uh, pay information portal information, but we will check back with them after this if, call. If I may interject, the information on checkbook isn't payments because none of them have gotten paid. There have been zero dollars paid as of today on checkbook NYC to any MWBEs or, or subs on this. Uh, what we have here is just the list of the contractors. And one other piece I'll throw out there, uh, and again, allow, and if we can pause the time for, for my colleague here, uh, the, there are seven subcontractors listed. Uh, I'm demanding that by the end of this hearing, you come back with the names of the contractors and the type of MWBE they are. Uh, but I'll just ask and allow my colleague to follow up. And if we can restore at least two minutes to her clock, as I've spoken, um, for the 30 per 15% requirement, can that be all women owned business enterprises, all Asian American owned business enterprises, uh, or should it also have to include black owned business enterprises? This can be for mocks or do it. This is also a softball. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we've worked very closely with IBM to, uh, to add as many uh, MWB contractors as possible um, based on their qualifications. Uh, and we will continue to do so. That is a top priority for do it. Well, just to conclude, I just want to say that we want to make sure that there's a clear understanding of how important this issue is of contracts. Uh, the city, we want to make sure, is understanding that we are maximizing uh, the selection of those who receive the contracts so that we get the benefit of our dollars. And they're not, in fact, some services that can't, in fact, be done in-house or by some of the unions that are currently here in the city that we can save some of that money and enhance what it is that city workers are getting from the city. So that's another track that we haven't talked about, or at least I haven't heard during the time that I was listening, uh, how how necessary is, is it that these large mega corporations get these contracts when in fact there may be unions that have the capacity uh, to do the work that the city needs to have done. 
And I do want to commend you uh, for all of the things that you did do, as you highlighted in the beginning of your report, the turnaround for getting things done and up, because certainly this pandemic has been a monster and has caused all of us to jump into high gear and double and triple and quadruple time. So for what you have accomplished in that regard, we, we're appreciative. But we wanna make sure that we track this money. We wanna make sure that uh, other people don't, other organizations don't uh, benefit unduly because of this pandemic and just circumstances in general. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the uh, extra time. Thank you. And just uh, uh, to Director Olds, uh, with regards to satisfying the MWB requirement, uh, can, can somebody satisfy it using only one specific subgroup or is there uh, a requirement or incentive to actually have black owned businesses and women owned businesses, but more than just one specific group? Sure. Um for each individual contract that is entered into, the agency will set the terms of how that MWBE goal can be met. Um, so for this particular contract, uh, I'm not sure how do it set up the goal. It's likely that the, that the goal can be met by any city certified MWBE, although if they specified the goal for this contract, you know, then it would be met specifically by that, by that group. Uh, is there any goal on the back to do it? Is there any goal on this for uh, black owned business enterprises? So uh, thank you for the question, council member. Uh, there are no diversity goals uh, within the 15%. It's just the overall uh, certified MWBE goal. So to clarify, to, just to help provide some clarification, that means that the goal can be met by any group that is certified as an MWBE with the city. It could be met by a black owned uh, firm. It could be met by a woman owned firm. It could be met by an Asian owned firm. There are several firms that are uh, fit the designation of a certified MWBE within the city's program. And I think what Mr. Abalafia is saying is that either any of those organizations could be used to meet the city's uh, MWBE goal for the contract. If somebody is watching at home right now and they are a uh, black or women owned business that does technology work and they hear that you've done two million dollars out of nine million required as of what you've already spent and that we're going to be spending 200 million so 30 million dollars is on the table for mwbe's who does somebody call if they want a piece of this contract thank you for that question council member um I, I would say uh, even just recently, uh, Do It held a virtual uh, MWBE event, which was a tremendous success, um, where we had um, in excess of 100 uh, vendor participants uh, at the event. Um, they had an opportunity to meet with various uh, Do It representatives, um, as well as um, Do It vendor representatives to seek out subcontracting opportunities under existing contracts. Um, we always look for opportunities to incorporate MWBEs specifically in this contract and have regular conversations with IBM, not only about their progress, but about adding new vendors um, you know, a, as, as the opportunities present themselves. What is the phone number or email somebody can contact if they want a piece of the $30 million on this table? Sure. I, I, you could you could give them my email address. That would be fine. What uh, is your email it's, address? It's R-A-B-O-U-L-A-F-I-A at doit, G-O-I-T-T dot N-Y-C dot gov. Uh, many of the vendors are very familiar with working with me since I've worked with them for a number of years, and I would be very happy to take each and every call uh, from the vendor community. And if people can copy contracts at benkalos.com, I'm interested in getting that $30 million into the pockets of the MWBE community. Uh, thank you, Chair Barron, for the uh, tag team. I see we've been uh, joined. I, I already acknowledged our uh, Council Member Rosenthal, who has her hand up. And if we can give her the clock, we'd love to hear. Great, thank you so much, um, Chair Kalos. Um, thank you so much to the 
Mayor's office um, on contracts. Thank you, Chair Barron. Always appreciate you. Um, and to do it, thank you so much for your hard work during the pandemic. I really just um, have one question. Um, given that so much of the pandemic, so, so much pandemic funding from the federal government, I'm wondering if any part of the, I guess, expanded or original IBM contract um, is uh, eligible for reimbursement. That is an excellent question, Councilmember uh, Rosenthal. Um, we would like to get you the most accurate response possible regarding the, the eligible funding breakdown under the contract, um, and we can provide you that information um, after this hearing. Okay, and um, that's fine. And let me let me just get a little specific so I make sure we're we're talking the same language. So what you're saying is that of this contract, there might be parts of it, um, either services provided by IBM or a subcontractor who did work regarding the pandemic that the sit that is eligible for the city to get reimbursement for. And um, so, so first question, and well, let's confirm that. Are we hearing each other? Yes, yes. Okay. Member. And then would that, those things, uh, ha has the money already been spent or do you think there are spendings coming up that, I don't know if that's a verb, but, um, that could be el also eligible for reimbursement, pandemic reimbursement. So again, council member, that is an excellent question. And we can provide you with the most detailed response possible um, once we confer with our uh, management and budget team. Sorry, I'm just thinking, I'm hearing your answer. Thank you very much. So, so do it. So just to confirm a couple of things. So do it's management and budget team will confirm this information. We'll send over that information. You'll send it over to the committee. And um, okay. So then my question for Mox is on a larger level, do it certainly being a good example and this contract being a great example, is Mox tracking contractual work that we could get pandemic reimbursement for. Um, I'm pretty sure OMB is, although it's not, it's very, very opaque. Um, yeah, but is Max tracking this at all? I think Max might need to be unmuted. Yeah, Victor, hang on one sec. Uh, you need to be unmuted by committee council. Hang on. Okay, Victor, start okay. again. Yep, no worries. Uh, that That is being tracked by OMB. Mox was tracking uh, contract registrations, especially during the course of the emergency executive order, we were registering the contracts and that, that was primarily our, our role. Registering contracts separate and apart from whether or not it had FEMA reimbursement. Well well, as part of the contracting process, agencies were communicating with OMB about the source of funding, ensuring that the funding was available. Uh, after that was confirmed and the contract was reviewed as to form by the law department and the complete contract package was got compiled it. and it was sent to MOX for registration. Got it, got it. So in Passport, I assume that was all done through Passport. No, everything, everything was done outside. So Passport Release 3 actually launched during the course of the pandemic. So we started doing emergency procurements prior to its release. So all of the emergency contracts were done outside of Passport, pursuant to the emergency executive order. Of course, of course, no no judgment, just asking sure. uh, descriptions. Um, so how all I know in life are Passport, Accelerator, and the old Vendex system. So am I missing something or were they all done under old Vendex? 
Uh, agencies were fine. uploading the the contract packages to APT, the Automated Procurement Tracker. That was the, the precursor to packages being submitted Got through Passport. Thank sure. you. Chair, may I ask a couple more questions? Sure, we can give you another two minutes. Yeah. Um, two, add uh, two minutes to the clock, please. Great, thank you. Um, Director Olds, in the A, advanced procurement tracking system. I know I'm not saying close that, enough. Right? That's fine. <laughs> uh, I used to work for a firm called APM, which I never knew what it stood for. So we called it apple pears and mangoes. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, but does that track funding source? So in other words, is one of the fields that you put in that this would get federal, state, or city money or some combination, whatever? Uh, I believe it does. I, I have to check with my deputy director to ensure that that's where it's tracked. I know that there's a record of it. I just, I, I don't want to steer you to the wrong place for where it might be. So I, I can I can let you know that. Great. I don't know if Mr. Murray wants to say something. You can say no for pass, no problem. Um, but you know, if so, hypothetically, we could get at this reimbursement issue by looking at the emergency contracts that were registered and calling out the federal reimbursement portion. Um, just might be interesting to look at. You know, of course, my bigger concern is about making sure that we're getting a, the full amount of federal reimbursement that we can get. And in particular, as regards to this contract, that each time there was a, um, you know, it was an emergency contract, right? So likely all the add-ons were due to the pandemic and that each of the add-ons um, would get the federal reimbursement opportunity that the city should be getting. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, look forward to hearing from the city on this. Thank you very much for the time, Chair Kalos. Thank you, to, to follow on that line of questioning, uh, in order for the this to have been an emergency contract, wouldn't everything in the contract have to be COVID related? Director Olds? Yes. Thank you for the straight answer. Uh, do it. Is everything in this contract COVID related? Yes, that is correct. Amazing. So between the two of you, Council Member Rosenthal has made a very strong point uh, is all $193 million of this going to be eligible for federal reimbursement under the COVID relief funds? Happy to take that question back to OMB, who's probably more appropriate to answer the reimbursement questions, but uh, the contract was certainly entered into for the purposes of responding to the pandemic. Great. Uh, so let's let's put a focus on 311. Um, why did 311 need an emergency contract that existed before the pandemic it will exist after this pandemic it is a great thing so what was the emergency for 311 <clears throat> and and please have your documents ready thank you for the question council member uh, the work that was performed under the ibm emergency contract related to 311 was critical for the city's response to the COVID pandemic and was performed in the best interest of the city of New York. Work order number 22 under amendment number four included scope for work on the 311 system and application. Uh, the main purpose of this work order was to work on updating and fortifying the 311 platform capability to handle the increased demands due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the development of the service request form to address the numerous added services the city provided its citizens during this time, such as the Get Meals program, the online marriage ceremony application Get Cupid, the Test and Trace program, vaccinations, et cetera. And all of that was added to 311? So 
all of those services were tied to 311 under the emergency contract. So if I go on 311 right now, I can get a marriage license to get Cupid? I, I, certainly, I think what my colleague was saying is that um, a Project Cupid, the online marriage uh, licensing program, is one of the things that um, we uh, that we worked on. Um, but to bring it back to your question, council member, you were asking why the 301 enhancements were necessary under emergency contract. So to get back to that question, again, to reiterate what my colleague said, you know, in this time of unprecedented crisis, 311 was taking a record number of calls. Uh, we took the most calls ever this last past, this past year. Um, and, you know, 311 sort of went from uh, a non-emergency hotline where you call to find out about alternate side parking or file, um, you know, a service request to suddenly our call takers were tasked with um, sending, you know, coordinating meal deliveries for people, providing essential COVID information to people. So again, it was just critical that 311 be able to handle the unprecedented demand on the system. Uh, with regard to that unprecedented demand on your document, base contracts and cost amendments one, two, and six on page 635, uh, if you want to pull it up on your computers, and we're going to make this page available to the public, uh, it says, three, quote, 311 has experienced 300% increase in call volume due to COVID-19 related questions, end quote. That is uh, clause two under purpose and project scope. Uh, does that sound familiar? Yes, that sounds familiar. Great. Uh, if everyone watching could join me and as well as the people on this call, if you can go to my favorite website from the city, nyc.gov slash MMR. And that stands for Mayor's Management Report. And on that page, if folks can join me, there's a pull down and you have an option of downloading the full report. If you have insomnia, I recommend downloading the full report. It's longer than ever, thanks to some of our work from my previous committee, but the number two option is 301 Customer Service Center. So if you can click that and hit go, it should bring up the 311 system. And so on the 301 system, there is the first indicator on page three, if uh, I don't care if it's mocks or do it, but if folks can share with me the 301 calls, it has a star because it's a critical indicator. Uh, and so let me know if you were able to follow along on the MMR. So in fiscal year 2017, would you agree that there were 20,540,000 uh, uh, million calls? Uh, 20.5 20. million calls. Uh, council member, I don't have the MMR in front of me, but I do know that the end of 2020, we announced a record number of, I think it was 24 and a half or 25 million calls that 301 took. And that's separate from the, from the intake that we do via Twitter, via the app, via, you know, um, the 301 portal. Uh, I, I would say that what you just testified is inaccurate, so I'm going to ask you to please pull up the MMR now so you can give accurate testimony. So fiscal year 2017, which is uh, 16 to 17, had 20.5 million calls. Fiscal year 18 had 20.6 million calls. Uh, fiscal year 19 had 19.5 million calls. Fiscal year 20 which ended in June of 2020, which was during the height of the pandemic, ended with 21.5 million calls, which is not substantially larger than anybody else. And fiscal year 21 ending June 30th, 2021, had 21.7 million calls. So where is 300% uh, is, is the MMR inaccurate? Is Mayor de Blasio lying? 
Uh, now, council member, I want to I want to clarify. I appreciate I appreciate you pulling up the numbers. You know, data is incredible. It, to it is incredibly data driven. What I want to clarify is I want to go back to what I said earlier, which is that the role of 311 really changed at the start of the pandemic. So previously, a lot of the calls that we took, a lot of them were resolved by the IVR, sort of that automated system at front. I mentioned alternate side parking earlier. That's because historically, alternate side parking has been one of our top drivers. So previously, with a lot of the majority of the calls that 311 took pre-COVID, were people calling 311, hearing an automated message, explaining, for example, when alternate side parking is, talking about street closures, whatever, and then they would hang up. So that's considered a 301 call, but that's not a call that ever reaches an, reach, reach an agent. So when we're talking about this unprecedented demand on 311, when we're talking about this 300% uptick, what we're talking about is phone calls that phone calls from needy New Yorkers who needed information at the height of the pandemic, who, who needed meal deliveries, who needed to find out, you know, where they could get essential resources, who needed to find out where they could get a We're talking about people who had to call 311 and had to be connected to an actual 311 agent to get the answer. And that's where the, that's where the uptick came from. What did that have to do with the software? That sounds like we should have seen an increase and the number of people working at 311. And uh, wouldn't we you are. know that if you look at the mayor's management report, we actually had fewer people working at 311 in fiscal year 21 than we did in 2020. So we actually went from 347 to 355 to 375 to 403 at the height of the pandemic in 2020. And then in 2021, we were down to 387. And so we have budgeted in fiscal year 22, an extra uh, for an additional 20 or so uh, people. It's actually uh, 17. And uh, our budget really hasn't gone up. I will note that um, there was additional overtime paid. Uh, it went from... Uh, 252,000 in fiscal year 19 to 400,000. But uh, we're talking about $200 million contracts and 301 hasn't changed their staffing significantly. They have not increased their overtime significantly. Uh, and within regards to what you talked about, a service request, the service requests in fiscal year 19 were 3,200 and the fiscal year 21 were 3,400. So show me the data that says that there was a quote unquote, 301 has experienced a 300% increase in call volume due to COVID-19 related questions that necessitated spending millions on software infrastructure, not human infrastructure. Uh, so again, as you know, the call takers obviously rely on a strong 301 backend system. Uh, to your point, we did have to create at record speed a number of new COVID-related service requests, which had to be done very quickly. And uh, to your point, you know, we also had to uh, bring in contracted staff to assist with the overwhelming call volume. Um, you know, especially uh, you know at the beginning of the pandemic with, with social distancing and all of those other limitations in place. We also were up against um space limitations for the number of people the number of call takers we could actually safely have in one space are, are so you I, testifying that the mmr does not reflect contracted personnel who were answering phones for 311 uh no council member that's not it i'm not i'm not speaking about the mmr i, ju I just wanted to provide a little bit more clarity on my understanding of how 311 was functioning. Okay, so, so, so far you've told me that Checkbook NYC is not telling the truth and that there's more than seven vendors somehow and that there's more than $2 million being paid out uh, and that it's IBM's fault for not updating Checkbook, um, which you, you heard from my colleague, Councilmember Barron, now you're telling me that the mayor's management report is inaccurate and does not reflect what was really going on on 301? 
I certainly am not saying that the MMR is an accurate council member. As I said, I, I don't have the MMR in front of me, but I wanted to be responsive to your questions and provide, provide are, to you. Are you able, are you on a computer right now? Um, are you and the assistant commissioner at a commu computer? Yes, we're at a computer. Are you able to navigate to nyc.gov slash MMR? Uh, sure, uh, but you know, again, council member, um, I'm, we're ha I'm happy to take a look at the MMR after the hearing. I'm happy to consult with my colleagues here to to clarify any of these outstanding outstanding questions. But again, you know, we're here today to talk about um, emergency procurement during during the pandemic, and that is what we are trying to be responsive to you about right now. Sure, and I guess I've asked what the emergency contract with NY 311 was for. You talked about all these new needs. We pulled from the contract, which mentioned a 300% increase, but it's not reflected in any public facing documents. And so as opposed to saying, we made a mistake, maybe that shouldn't have been in the contract. Um, I'll throw it over to Mox. When you evaluated the emergency contract, did you review page 635 where it said 311 has experienced a 300% increase? And if, if that fact is material false, would that have had an impact on the approval? So just to clarify again what the various roles were during the emergency procurement process, um, Prior to agencies moving forward with an emergency procurement, the agency head was required to submit a determination to MOX in the law department. So uh, we, we were not reviewing contracts or works that or work that was performed after the fact when we were approving an agency's ability to move forward with an emergency contract. So if DOIT expressed a need in needing to focus in on some area within the city uh, for which it has oversight, in relation to responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, that would have been completely reasonable for us to say, sure, move forward with that contract. We understand the connection to the COVID crisis and to allow do it to you know, enter into that contract. Um, MOX doesn't review contracts that are entered into by agencies. It's, that's not a part of our uh, oversight. Agency general counsels do that in coordination with the law department. So we wouldn't have reviewed the contract that do it was entering into and certainly wouldn't have done that prior to allowing them to move forward with an emergency purchase. So big picture question, do it in a contract says we need to get an emergency contract on three and one because of everything we just heard testified. Plus in the document itself, it says there's a 300% increase in call volume. Uh, we're going from 20,000 calls to 60,000 calls and somehow the software we developed can't handle a three victor increase because it wasn't scalable. We had a bad contract to begin with. And then you come back and you see, wait, there wasn't a 300% increase and maybe we're spending a lot of money we don't need to. And we have two more years in the contract with $140 million. Where did the buck stop? Whose job is it to be like, maybe we don't need to spend $200 million on upgrading a system that doesn't need to handle 60,000 calls a day. It only needs to handle 20,000. Sure. And, and I understand and appreciate your question, uh, Councilmember Kalos. I have confidence in the leadership at Do It. Uh, it sounds like they are, they've committed to working with you to understand if there is a discrepancy and what that discrepancy might be. And it might in turn uh, wind up there that there is not a discrepancy and that there's a reasonable explanation for why you're seeing information in the MMR and Do It is trying to explain that there's an uptick in volume that isn't reflected in the MMR. So, you know, I, I, I imagine that do it will work with your office to clarify any apparent discrepancy, but, uh, but the contract as a whole, uh, as I understand it, wasn't focused exclusively on the 311 call center. I, I understand that to be a part of the contract and there are other areas within the contract that were also necessary to respond to the pandemic. So it's not to say that this 311 component uh, should not have been within the contract. I, I, I trust that do it uh, did a proper analysis and said that it should have been and they'll work with you to clarify whatever discrepancy appears to be uh, apparent now. But there are other portions of the contract, I think, that do it talked we, about. We, that we, also will get, we will get, get there. We have all day. So Assistant Commissioner Robert Avalafia, now that you've heard that there's this huge discrepancy between what was in your contract documents, what you've testified, and what's in the MMR, 
would you consider revisiting the three and one contract, pulling it off of an emergency and uh, perhaps putting it out to bid and even <clears throat> perhaps scaling back the project itself? Uh, thank you for that question, council member. Uh, no, I absolutely would not. Um, I, I would also add that, um, you know, clearly there would be an influx of calls related to, to COVID-19 uh, and the emergency. Um, that should not be a dispute with, with anyone. So clearly there's a disconnect here that we will have to get back to you on. Can I just have permission from, uh, can we get permission from the council to share on the screen the MMR? It's publicly accessible at nyc.gov slash MMR. So it isn't a matter of my word and a URL versus the others. Alex, if we can get an answer from the team. Give me a moment, council member. Thank you. We, 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 so, so uh, Commissioner Olds, what, what do we do? The, the assistant commissioner is saying absolutely not. The facts are not the facts. The MMR is, is wrong and what have you. I, I would have expected at least like, wow, these are, these are valid points. We're gonna look into it versus just a straight up no. Sure, council member, I, I understand uh, the questions that you're asking and I, I, I wanna be careful um, to, I guess, reiterate what I previously said, which is that there, based on the questions that you've asked, uh, appears to be a discrepancy. I'm, I'm not in fact sure that there is a discrepancy. I think Do It is just asking for the opportunity to come back to you with clarifying information for why they thought that there is a 300% a increase in 311 sure. call the, volume and how that relates to the contract. The, the hearing started at one o'clock. Uh, I've asked for answers during this hearing. Uh, we had a previous hearing, uh, Director Old, at a previous hearing, a director old with Mercida Eberich from head of procurement at DCAS. Uh, was DCAS able to get me answers during the hearing uh, where I asked a question? They said, we'll get back to you. I said, I want the hearing answer during the hearing. And then Mercida was actually able to give me the answer during the hearing. Did that actually happen? Were you there for that? I don't remember if that was with me or with, with uh, my predecessor, Dan Simon. Um, if you if you say that it happened, I trust that you that it, that I it see, happened. I, I no see Ryan that, nodding his head that that happened. I yeah, know. I have no reason to, to, I'm to doubt that. Ryan, because he he can be a, a witness. <laughs> Ryan, did that in fact happen? No, I do, I do recall the hearing you're speaking about, and it was uh, specific to, I think, environmentally preferable purchasing. That's so. It was it was on the uh, clawbacks from the COVID contracts where we put out like oh. hundred million dollar COVID <laughs> contracts, and then. We asked the sure. like the specific contracts, and she kept back with every single one of them that like we'd gotten the money back. So, uh, assistant commissioners, can we get the answer that we'd asked before about which MWBE contractors were added that aren't reflected on checkbook? Do we have that answer yet? Do we have somebody at Do It trying to get that answer? Uh, council member, like I said, I'm happy to follow up with you. Uh, after I don't want follow up. We're going to be here for hours. I want. One of you to reach out to somebody else that are there more than two employees that do it today? Certainly there are more than two employees. At Is there it. another employee who can go find out if there's additional MW and additional contractors not listed on checkbook? Uh, to the extent possible, obviously we will get you that information. I want it during the hearing. Cool. So uh, other question. Uh, and this would possibly be for City Hall, but do any of you recall or have personal knowledge of the fact that we asked if 311 would join us for this hearing? Well, do it runs 311 uh, now. A, a 311 is under the purview of Commissioner Tish. So uh, I know part of part of my job is working with 311. So from my okay. perspective, I say that 311 is represented here today, Council Member. Where is the director of 311? Can you please get him to join the hearing? Uh, I'm, I'm here today with my colleague. Again, we're here today to talk about emergency procurement during the pandemic. That's what Robert is here to discuss. Do you um, have more knowledge of how Free One operates than Joseph Morisot, who's been running it for, I think, a decade or more? Um, I work closely with Joe Morisot. Of course, um, I work very closely with Joe Morisot and the rest of the Three and One team. Again, in April uh, of 2020, I believe, at the height of the pandemic when 311 was bogged down, uh, you know, with um, unreasonable wait times, uh, Commissioner Tish 
was asked to resume uh, resume um, uh, responsibility of 311. And so uh, commission, under Commissioner T Joe Morris Rowe, as do I, we both work you know, under Commissioner Tish very closely on all things pertaining to 311. Are you able to give me a URL or anything that can support your assertion about the 300% increase at 311 other than your testimony that has been controverted by the mayor himself? Um, I, I, again, I'm happy to follow, you know, um, obviously I take the council's oversight role incredibly seriously. So. When you talk about the MMR, I don't want to speak off the cuff. I really would like the opportunity to talk to my data folks who work on the MMR. I, I mean, I know from, I know that you don't want me to talk about a press release, and I understand that, but I know that from- You can talk about a press release. I think I have it up here now. Which press release? Give us the URL. Okay, I believe last December we put out a press release announcing the record number of calls that threw on one took. I don't have that press release in front of me, but I want to say that we said it was 24 and a half, 25 million record number of calls. I remember we put that out last year. So you're asking about any public facing documents that would back up our um, assertion that 311 call volume increased. So I, I do want to bring your attention to that. So I Googled it, and so I'm seeing a February 19th, 2019 uh, release that says 311 sets new record with 44 million customer interactions in 2018, which was an increase of 10.2% over 2017. Uh, but this was well ahead of the pandemic. Uh, no, I'm referring to something that I think was released uh, last December. Um, I want to say like December 31st, right at the end of the uh, of, of the year. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a other. If, if I had a, I would just Google it. But uh, again, I, I I don't want to belabor the point under press release. I just wanted to reference something that I know is a public facing document that does explicitly speak to the increased volume that came in through 301. I'm, I'm literally on the website, but all the public data, and, and again, if you want to pull the URL and read it, I've read my fair share of URLs in the past uh, two hours. Um, is there a exclusivity agreement between Doit and IBM that they are the only provider who is able to maintain or upgrade the three-on-one system? Thank you for that uh, question, council member. Um, just bear with me one sec. So to answer your question, council member, um, yes, IBM is the contracted vendor to provide 301 support on this on the 301 system. Are they a sole source provider? Are they the only people who are allowed to service 311 under some contract that we do not have? So the services that are currently provided under the IBM uh, emergency contract support 311 currently before the emergency contract you made reference to purchasing off a previous contract what contract was that so you're referring to the previous contract for 311 in your testimony you state that you purchased off of a pre-existing ibm contract that you used it as a quote-unquote framework i believe Yes, that's correct. So, so what was that the, contract, and how much was it? So the the three one one IBM task order um, 
was uh, approximately $33 million. And that was $33 million on the emergency contract or the previous contract? So that, that task order was established under the do it IBM systems integration contract that was referenced previously. Got it. So when the city moved over, so folks haven't been paying attention, which no one should be paying attention to this level of detail. So New York City used to have a platform that I believe was based on Oracle. We switched to a new platform. And so the new 301 platform cost us $33 million to build for the transfer over to a new system? Yes, that is correct. Okay. How much of this $200 million contract is going to 311? Just bear with me one sec, council member. We will have to get back to you on the exact number because it, it involves multiple uh, work orders. Uh, we have three work orders that we were provided. Uh, the first work order, uh, this would be on the statements of work document. This is uh, work order amendments three, four, five, seven, and eight dot PDF. And so we have the first work order on May 1st, 2020 to October 31st, 2020 for $3.2 million at page 130. Does that sound correct? Yes, that sounds correct. Second work order, page 179, contract states November 1st, 2020 to February 28th, 2021 for 4.4 4 million. That's page 179 of that same document. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, we have a third work order. That work order is page 315 with contract dates March 21st, 2021 to June 30th, 2021. That one is valued at $7 million. The contract names respectively are Do It IBM 021 311, Do It IBM.029 311 phase two. Uh, and sorry, one more is there was one more. Uh, but so I think we come out to about $14 million, give or take. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. For the contract. For, for these three contracts, did any of them involve non-COVID related work? No. Okay, are you able to pull up uh, your scope of work for do it ibm 021-311 work order number 10 on pages 13 to 19? It's page 142 in the large PDF you sent over. <clears throat> Just bear with me one sec. Sure. Assistant commissioners, can we ask that you turn on the mic and 
give testimony. And I believe at the beginning of the hearing, I said we'd be referencing these two documents, so you should have them on hand. Uh, hi, Council Member. Um, sorry for the delay. As you know, we had to relocate right before, uh, you know, right as the hearing started. So the team is just trying to pull the, pull those up right now. It was on it was on a different device. That that's the that's the delay. So my apologies for that. Um, but while we wait, I I did want to say my um uh, I want to correct myself when I was talking about the record number of calls. It was twenty three point five million dollars. I was able to find it on my probably the reason it wasn't coming up is because it's on the mayor's press release page, not not do it or three on one. And this is a press release from December 31st, 2020. And it says Mayor de Blasio announced three on one's record setting 23.5 million calls in 2020. So I, I wanted to clarify and share that. And in the meantime, we're trying to pull up these other documents. So if the previous year had 20 1.5 million calls, uh, and, and there's an average of 20 million calls, 23 million is not 30% more, it's, it's barely over 10% more. Um, again, um, uh, just speaking about the types of calls that were, that were coming in, I know that these were much more time consuming calls, calls that couldn't be resolved by the, by the IVR. But again, certainly phone calls are not the only, only way that 311 um, interacts with customers. As I'm sure you know, you can use the 311 app, you can use the 311 portal online, you can tweet. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a myriad of ways to, um, uh, to reach out to 311 and be connected to, um, uh, to uh, assistance there. Uh, uh, Alex, do we have a decision on whether or not we're allowed to share a page of the mayor's management report for the public to view? Yeah, we cannot, unfortunately, share. Um, okay, yeah. I'm just going to start reading off from the columns. So uh, the Spanish language calls starting in fiscal year 2017 were 698,000, um, again, these numbers are, are staying largely flat with a small bump in 2020. Uh, through one calls in languages other than English, starting in 2017, 71,000, 65,000, 60,000, 81,000, 112,000. In this case, it, it is going up, but we are talking about thousands, not millions. The through one mobile app contacts in fiscal year 17, we're at 1.3 million, 18, 1.8 million, 2.2 million, 2.2. 2 million, 2.2 million. Uh, for the text contacts, uh, we go in 17 at 144,000 to 254,000 to 253,000 to 424,000 to 356,000. Again, we're in thousands. Through on online site visits actually start going down. Fiscal year 17, we're at 17 million, 19.3 uh, million, 20.1 million, 10.5 million, 13.4 million. Uh, completed service requests, again, stays flat, starts in 2017 at 2.8 million, then 3 million, 3.2, 2.9 million in 2020 uh, fiscal year, and then 3.4 million again in fiscal year 21. Knowledge articles, which is just going to their website for information, is at 22.5 million, 24.6, 24. 12, they actually went down during the pandemic, and then 25.3 going up to the average. So all these numbers stay somewhat flat through the years, and it is incredibly painful that the council will not allow us to just share a screen when people are actually saying that what's in the mayor's management report isn't in the mayor's management report, and that there was in fact a 300% increase when there was no such increase. Have you been able to locate the work order? Uh, so, council member, thank you for uh, thank you for sharing those figures from the MMR uh, with us. Like I said, I I do look, I would like the opportunity to confer with my colleagues who um, who uh, compile all the data for the agency. So I don't want to I don't want to misspeak here. So I'm going to have to get back to you on your MMR question. But certainly it's it's on my but certainly I will confer with the team and do it. We'll follow. 
have you been able to access the document in question? I, I, <clears throat> I don't believe so. Again, we are, we had to switch devices, um, you know, during the, the issue that you raised before. Um, so we're actually not logged in on a, on the computer that had that information. Um, are you do, able to does do it, have access to a document share in my office? We use Google drive. Uh, so I'm able to work at my legislative office at 250 Broadway. I'm currently in my district office. A lot of the work that I did was actually from home. And so I've accessed things over the uh, Google drive. Uh, if you're unable to, do you have a, a document share like Google drive or, uh, Dropbox or something else? Does do it have a document sharing system? Yeah, we have the ability to access the document. Um, but if you can share the document, that would be very helpful to move. Uh, I, 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 we're, we're working on it. I, I heard you, council member, when you said that the sergeants aren't able to share the screen. Otherwise, you would share the document with us. I, I, I would love to share the screen. There are people at home scratching their head, being like, "Why can't they share the screen?" Uh, so yes, I, I I do apologize. Like Robert said, this is just a matter of us logging um, of, of us logging in um, to pull up the uh, information. Of, I, I believe for security reasons, we don't use you know third party things like. Um, right. You'd be surprised how secure the cloud is. Uh, can we get an, a, a, an answer on whether or not I'm allowed to hold up a piece of paper? <laughs> So I believe you're, are you referring to amendment? I'm sorry, just bear with me. Wh which amendment did you say you're referring to? I am referring to work order uh, number 10, uh, which is uh, labeled with uh, IBM work order number do it dash IBM dash 021 at dash 311. And it is page 142 of the 460 page document that was provided. I'm just gonna step out. Okay, sure. Actually, can you can can you I'm going to take a five second recess to step away for a moment.
Were you able to find the document? I believe we're logging into the system now. Is that right? Yes, we're logging into the system now, council member. So we should be able to pull it up momentarily. I, I, I do apologize for the delay. It's because we, it's because we switched. This is, this is the, the second work tech related uh, delay. So I, I'm holding up a piece of paper on a digital device. This is page 142 of what you sent over. And so it has three, sorry, it has five columns. Uh, Assistant Commissioners, if you are able to see that uh, fifth column, can you tell me what it says? Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not a high enough resolution. I can see the box, but I, I can't make out the words. Um. Does it look like it says COVID related? Yes. Is it clear that some places it is checked and other places it is not? Yes, there is no X in the other boxes. So you have testified. The document says that things were COVID related and yet it, IBM actually provided an SOW where it actually indicated a list of 72 changes to 311 and a majority of those changes were not checked off as COVID related. So as, as mentioned previously, all of the work under the contract is COVID related. Okay, so on this document, it says that um, one of the things we need to do is, let me just pull it up. So service change number 34, restore precinct-based routing for parking permit misuse complaints. Uh, that is number 34. That is page 15 of this work order. That is page 144 of the document. Please, and COVID related is not checked. Please tell me the emergency COVID related uh, necessity of uh, parking permit misuse complaints. Uh, Council member, as my colleague and as Mox um, already testified, all of the work under under this contract is is COVID related. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't think that we're prepared to go off, you know, item, item by item. But again, I just want to, I just want to repeat what Robert and what Mox has said, which is that um, we previously indicated that all of all of the spending is COVID related. It, it, it literally doesn't have the checkbox next to it. There's no checkbox. It doesn't say COVID related. How are parking permits COVID related? This is where you say, we'll look into it and we'll fix that and we will pull that out of the emergency contract that shouldn't have been here to begin with. You have the document in front of you. I got it from you. I'm holding it up in front of my camera just in case. So we will have to get back to you on that council member Kalos. Is there a check mark next to item number 34 for COVID related or not? Are parking placards COVID related according to this document? A council member, again, I don't think we're gonna go by this item by item. Uh, you know, my colleague- No, no we are. That's, that's what the contracts committee does. This is oversight. This is us looking at a contract that was given as an emergency contract you're telling us everything's coronavirus related. There's literally a column that says these things aren't related. And I'm not trying to make you squirm. I'm just trying to get you guys to admit that this shouldn't, these pieces shouldn't have been part of an emergency procurement and that we need to do a little bit better and treat emergencies as emergencies and everything else can go through a regular process. But anything else is gaslighting at best and like you are under oath. Uh, certainly, I hear you, and I appreciate that point. 
Um, you know, I want to circle back. I want to circle back with my team here so that we're getting you the right information. Um, as, as you know, we gave you over 1800 pages of documents, I think it was. So I just certainly want to make sure that I follow up the team. And how many of you, how many people work at Do It? How many employees do you have? Um, I, 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 I know what you're asking. Um, I, I know what you're really asking is how many people are, are working on this, on this particular issue. I certainly, after this hearing, uh, you know, I know many of my colleagues are, are streaming this hearing right now. Obviously, they know this is of the utmost priority. And they can send you the information. What I'm just going to say is you have hundreds of employees that do it. You got me. You got Adam Bermudez, my legislative director. You've got Alex Polinoff, my committee counsel. And you've got Leah Skripiak. And both of them are working on multiple committees. So when you say we gave you 1,800 documents, that is what I, as an attorney in the business, called burying your opponent in paper so that they can't find anything. And so going through here, we are seeing that there was a lot in this contract that weren't emergencies and weren't COVID related. Do you believe that when the federal government sees this hearing, that when my Congress member, Carol Maloney, over the Oversight Committee, sees this hearing, do you believe you will be able to get reimbursed for the parking permit misuse complaints that do not have a checkbox next to it for COVID related. Again, I just want to follow up on a, a point that we've made before, but I think really certainly bears repeating, which is, you know, all, all of the code, all of the work that, that we've done is directly related to the pandemic. Uh, you know, March 2020, we very quickly had to, uh, you know, um, very, we very quickly had to stand up a, a work from home situation and ensure continuity of services, um, unprecedented technology needs, dealing with, as you know, council members, some very old technology here. So broadly, you know, I just want to, I just want to bring it back to the point that the pandemic is still underway um, and that everything that we've done has been driven, you know, uh, my colleague spoke to all the checks that are in places, but I also just want to, again, bring it back to the, the necessity that work be done quickly and that there be continuity services. Are you, do you plan to submit as a COVID related need to the federal government reimbursement for parking placards? Uh, I believe earlier my colleagues uh, at Mox as well at Do It said uh, in re in regards to Councilmember Rosenthal's question about a federal reimbursement that we are going to have to follow up with OMB and some others. So on your question, but Director Olds, do you plan to support a request for reimbursement under COVID uh, federal funds for parking placards when you know that at a public hearing? that that item does not have a check mark next to it indicating COVID related. So well, what I think we need to do following the hearing is, is circle back with do it to take a look at the contract to see what was included within it to make sure that everything that uh, should have been included within the contract was uh, that that's uh, that's what I think is the next step. Director, I believe that was a very honest answer. I did not put you in a good position and I appreciate it, but you're the first one so far to be honest about the fact that there are some inconsistencies in the contract. Back to three one, another example, work order uh, task number 51 on here is around uh, the Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, was the Asian longhorn beetle, uh, number 51, put a star next to it. You should, do you have the documents in front of you yet? Uh, and, and no council member, unfortunately, we don't. Seems uh, awfully intentional at this point. It's been a couple of hours that the hearing's been going. I was able to pull it up on my laptop. So here is uh, a printout of the document. And we've got the Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, updated missed collection complaint logic to remove blocker for wood reports in Brooklyn or Queens. Wood pickup by Parks Department versus DSNY due to Asian longhorn beetle has ended. We actually got good news. No more Asian longhorn beetles. 
is this COVID related? There's no checkbox in the COVID box. Do you see that there is no checkbox in the COVID box? Is the longhorn beetle no longer plaguing New York City COVID related? So as mentioned previously, council member, all services provided under this contract um, are emergency related. And you, you, you acknowledge that you are under oath? Correct. You are saying under oath that the Asian longhorn beetle is related to the pandemic? As I, as I stated previously, all services under the contract are emergency related. Council member, if I, if I may interject here, um, I, I appreciate- Robert, um, I just have to ask you just as one person to another, like why, 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 perj like, why perjure yourself over something as silly as this? Like, were you involved in this? More, I think there's more complexity from a tech, technology perspective. Yeah, um, council member, if, if I may, I'm sorry to sure. interrupt. What I wanted to say is, um, of course, as you know, this is this is your hearing. You know, this is an oversight hearing on emergency procurement. Robert is our, you know, procurement vendor management point person, which is which is why he's here today. I appreciate I appreciate how thorough you're being in kind of going through the contract and calling out specific items, but we're not prepared to speak on each specific item because as you bring items to our attention, you know, we don't want to speak off the cuff. I I honestly do want to follow up with the appropriate colleagues, you know, at Do It to get more information about this because to Robert's point, I'm sure there's more complexity here and, you know, he's not the subject matter expert. When did we it. request this contract? When did we start requesting these materials? Uh, I, I, I don't recall. Would, would you believe me if I said August 17th, 2021? Uh, certainly, cer uh, certainly, I would believe you, Council Member. So August, September, October, we're at the end of November. You've had four months that we've requested to meet with Do It, that we've been requested to meet with your commissioner. Um, listen, no secret. I got 32 days left. I should be a lame duck. I shouldn't matter. This hearing shouldn't matter. Uh, you're saying you want to do all the right things now. Why couldn't why couldn't do it be responsive before this hearing? Why did I even have to call this hearing and waste everybody's time to begin with? Well, first of all, it's certainly never a waste of our time to be, appear before the council. I worked the council for a long time. I have nothing but respect uh, and love for the council. And and to your point, um, uh, to your point, certainly we want to get you the right information. I want to make sure that I have all the necessary contacts, which I don't have here today, and uh, I, I just I don't want to misspeak or speak off the cuff. Of course, I was aware at a high level that you were, you know, having conversations with, you know, city legislative affairs. But again, for today's hearing, um, I, I just I, I I wish I could give you more context, but I can't today. But I can certainly commit um, to following up following up with you after the hearing on the specific items that you're bringing to our attention today. I don't know that the uh, some of the items that you're bringing to us today, I don't know that those were things that had previously been flagged for us prior to this hearing. Robin, I've known you for a very long time. You did great work at the council. I think you do good work for Do It. Did you sign any of these contracts? Did you have anything to do with any of these statements of work? Is your name on any of these things? Uh, no, they're not. Same, same thing for you, Assistant Commissioner uh, Robert Abulafia. Is your name on any of these contracts? Did you sign any of this stuff? So as the uh, Chief Contracting Officer, uh, I would have signed off on any procurement documentation um, for this procurement. Why is it Deputy Commissioner Joseph Antonelli's name on all these documents and Commissioner Jesse Tish's name on all these documents and not you? They have the delegation to sign contractual documents. Do they, are you, so you are an assistant commissioner? Is associate the, commissioner. Say again? Associate commissioner. Associate, you're an associate commissioner, forgive me. So um, is it, how, how often, are contracts signed by 
um, are signed by a deputy commissioner or the commissioner themselves versus you? Uh, as I mentioned previously, I do not have delegation to sign off on a contract for do it. So on, only Joseph Antonelli can sign off on the contract. There are established delegations within do it. Um, and deputy commissioner Antonelli has a delegation to sign off on contracts. Did you, do you report to deputy Antonelli, deputy commissioner Antonelli? Correct. And does that person have the ability to hire and fire you? Uh, yes. Okay. And then the other name on these documents is Jesse Tish, Commissioner for Do It. Uh, do they have the power to hire and fire you? Uh, yes, that is correct. Okay. Do you know why you were here testify so testifying about contracts that you never signed and SOWs you never signed? Um, if, if I may, um, again, council member, I, I, I hear you. Um, I appreciate, I appreciate you. Um, you know, the topic of this hearing is oversight on emergency procurement during the pandemic. And as I said, my um, colleague, the associate commissioner over here, you know, he's, uh, he, he specifically focuses on procurement and vendor management. And so to the extent that our understanding is that your questions, um, you know, the topic of the hearing would be about procurement. We sent our procurement person today to speak to that at the, today's hearing. Associate Commissioner Robert Avalafia, these SOWs, were you involved in approving them and were you involved in managing their work or was it something that was handled at the deputy commissioner level? <clears throat> Just bear with me one sec. So when do it establish the emergency contract, we did so with an understanding that the highest order of contract management and program oversight was required. To that end, all work done under the contract is authorized in the form of a work order, 36 of which were produced prior to this hearing. Each work order sets out the total cost allowed for work required, the resources to be utilized, and the number of hours allowed. Work orders are reviewed and approved by multiple DOIT divisions, including DOIT's chief operating officer, the technical program manager, the chief financial officer's team, and the deputy commissioner for management and budgets team. The deputy commissioner for management and budget is the final sign off on all work orders. Regular project management meetings to review cost and vendor performance are held by DOIT's chief operating officer, the DOIT technical lead on the program. Uh, the chief financial officer and the deputy commissioner for management and budgets offices uh, also play a role as well. Who is the Do CO? The chief operating officer of Do It is Mike McGrath. And Mike McGrath had direct relationship with this? As, as mentioned. Um, and then who is the other person, the CPO, is, who's that? If, if, if it helps you, we could send you the entire org chart after the, the meeting. Would that be helpful to you? The only thing that helps me is what happens within the four squares of this hearing. Everything, I, I, will, I will be very honest. I've been a council member now for uh, seven years, almost 11 months. Anytime I've been promised something after the hearing, I don't think I, I wouldn't bet my life on whether or not I get documents after at a hearing. It's not a reflection on you. I think this is our first hearing with we'll do it. Um, so who is the, it's the chief program officer. Is that what you said? So, okay, let me, I'll just reread the sentence. Um, regular project management meetings to review costs and vendor performance are held by DOIT's chief operating officer, the DOIT technical lead on the program, uh, chief financial officer, and the deputy commissioner for management and budget. So who's the chief financial officer? Uh, the chief financial officer for DOIT is Laura Lee Giovanella. And for the deputy uh, at OMB, who is that? So the deputy commissioner for management and budget is Joe Antonelli. Got it. But all these people are within do it. 
Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, in the list of names of people who were in the meetings, you did not mention the assistant associate commissioner being you. So you were not part of these meetings. Correct. Okay. So I've known Robin forever. Robert, I'm just meeting you, but my, my argument would be these other people should be the ones who are testifying. Uh, and I get the, the wish to do a good job and fight the good fight, but just I counsel you to just be honest and with, with the deck you've been handed. And uh, if possible, I might ask one or both of you to reach out to them and ask them if they can come to this hearing because I think that they could better answer these questions. I don't think it's fair for me to be asking these questions. I'm gonna keep going, but um, I, I don't think it was fair for the two of you to be asked to, to testify on these items when you weren't approving these things. And so you, you may not be as familiar as the details as perhaps the people whose responsibility it was should be. Um, if you were to take a look at phase two on page 179 and phase three on page 315, um, there's references to 301 upgrades. It makes no mention of COVID at all in the work orders. And it's just about updating the 301 service request and expanding mobile app development. Uh, and so I guess the question is, were any of the things that have happened at 311 on phase two or phase three, items that were plan upgrades that were planned or necessary before the pandemic? Sorry, we were finally able to pull those documents up. Yay! <clears throat> so, so we've sort of reiterated this, but um, I will repeat. Um, the work that was performed under the IBM emergency contract related to 311 was critical for the city's response to the COVID pandemic and was performed in the best interest of the city of New York. So on page 183 of this document that was provided, uh, IBM 029 311 phase two, it says request to extend the 311 application originate from city agencies, the mayor's office or directives from legal and cyber mandates. There's no reference of COVID. Uh, we will share this document on our website, sorry, on the council website. Um, phase two, phase three, we're spending $7 million on core, so, so for phase two, page 184, core platform development is 51.9% of the contract. Uh, service requests are only 33%. The 3 one portal is 4.7 and enterprise correspondent is 7.1. So just talking about 311, uh, it's just so much money in an emergency contract. And I guess the platform that 311 operates on, is it owned by IBM? Is IBM the only company that's allowed to make changes to this platform? Are you allowed to make changes? Is there anyone at DoIt who's allowed to make changes to the 301 platform? <clears throat> Thank you for that question, council member. Um, IBM was contracted for those services for 311 uh, in the best interest of the city under the emergency contract. Is there anyone at Do It who has the ability to make changes to service requests or other items at on the 301 system? So what you're asking is, is the technical question over who, who can do that? That's something that um, I would 
I'm sorry, council member, that I just want to follow up with you on after after the hearing. Um, I don't uh, I I don't want to misspeak on the technical back end of 301 at this hearing right now. If you can pull up page 190 for your org chart on 311. I can't pull up a page number on this application. So this is the org chart on 311. Uh, up top, there are two boxes. The uh, boxes are in green says do it management. The boxes in blue say IBM management. There is a uh, square and that square says 311 app team. And there's a top square with three boxes. The first one is a product manager, which comes from do it. Then there's an IT project director, which is in blue, which means IBM. And then there's a functional lead slash MGRs, which I imagine means managers. That's again, do it. Uh, then there appears to be a second box below that. It has four boxes and it has architects and dev ops. And that box is shaded half green, half blue, which I take to mean that it is a team of both do it and IBM people. Uh, the reason I'm reading this through for anyone wondering is this was the directive I was given by our council in terms of some visuals. There are three boxes. That's a performance testing, system analyst, release management, support management. Those are all in blue, which indicate IBM. Then there are five scrum teams. Scrum teams are a good thing. It's agile project development. I like that. They're cross-functional. And so you have scrum masters. And you have across the five teams, you have four scrum masters that are entirely IBM and one scrum master, which is incredibly entirely do it. Similarly, you have of the five scrum teams, you have five developers and uh, three out of the five are half do it, half IBM. Then you have testers out of the uh, five scrum teams Three out of the five are half do it, half IBM. One of them is entirely IBM. One of them is entirely do it. Last but not least, there are five business analysts. Uh, four of them are IBM. One of them is do it. And then there is one UI UX person on Scrum Team 5, which is highlighted mobile. And that person is entirely IBM. So if you can unmute and tell me, does do it have people who can do this work? My apologies, council member. Can you repeat the question, please? I cannot. I just verbally described an entire chart. It's up on the screen, but the question is in point. Do you have developers, testers, business analysts, scrum masters, architects, dev ops, product manager, functional leads and managers that you can use instead of having to pay IBM? Uh, thank you for that question, council member. You know, um, uh, thank you for sharing that chart with me. Uh, with it's us. your chart. Yes, well, I, I don't have it in front of me, so thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, certainly, I hear your concerns today, you know, and we're, uh, you know, we're absolutely committed to looking looking into this for you. Do you guys have staff who can modify 311 yourselves? This chart says yes. Uh, again, you know, I my understanding is that, you know, our teams work very closely together, but I don't want to misspeak on this, so um, I, I hear your concerns, I, I hear your point, and um, I'm happy to circle back, circle, a follow up with the team after this hearing. So I'll just ask very clearly, do you have staff at Do It who can make updates and changes to 311? Yes or no? 
Again, I just don't want to speak to the, I don't want to misspeak on the technical back end of Thruin when obviously the city- Can somebody who is, can somebody from through from do it who has knowledge answer or can somebody who's willing to read the chart in front of them that I've verbally uh, described just share? Like this is, again, this is back to gaslighting and whether it's gaslighting at best or lying under oath, like, it's clear as day. Like I've described it, I've read it. Like there are people that do it who are scrum masters, developers, testers, business analysts, product managers, architects. So I think the only honest answer here is yes, you do have people who can do it. Associate Commissioner Rob. <clears throat> as a uh... Commissioner Levine just mentioned, we will have to get back to you on that. Is this piece of paper white? Yes. Okay. We can agree about one thing at least. So there are scrum masters. IBM is charging $215 to $245 an hour for a scrum master. Uh, how much is a scrum master at how, how much is a how much do you pay a scrum master at do it so thank you for that question council member we we're going to have to get back to you on that is is do it currently hiring Uh, and council member, to your, back to your question about the cost, I, I do want to I do want to refer you back to uh, my colleague's testimony, um, the, the second to last paragraph on page on you know on, on page one where um, I'm, I'm sorry I'm just I know it, I know it's here uh, yeah so so I want to note that right here in the testimony um, we wanted to make sure that you saw this part as well which is that the rates and terms that are included in the emergency contract uh, be consistent with rates and terms previously negotiated in similar in similar systems integrate, integrated contracts with IBM. So when you're asking about the, the rate, I just want you to have that context that uh, we were working with, you know, we were, you know, we had uh, rate charts that were consistent with previous non-emergency spending. Right? That is correct. So, so just to make this clear, city employees work 35 hours a week, call it 52 weeks a year. That's 1800 hours. As an attorney, I had to regularly bill more than 2000 hours, whatever you want to call it. Let's just call it a low end 1800. When you multiply 1820 times 245 an hour, you're talking about paying somebody $445,900 a year to be a scrum master. Now, the question is, is, is do it hiring? And so I, I would ask you to visit uh, nyc.gov slash site slash do it slash about slash careers dot page, because right now it looks like you've got 90 positions open. So if you wanna visit that page so you can get knowledge for yourself, I ask again, is do it hiring? Uh, again, again, council member, you know, we're, we're here specifically to talk about emergency procurement during the, during the pandemic. I, I hear the points that you're making. I, I'm I asking why we're paying $400,000 a year for somebody that do it is currently trying to hire at a hundred or $150,000 a year. Uh, I hear what you're saying, and I'm certainly happy, you know, I'm certainly committed to following up. I, again, when we're talking about the pandemic, we're talking about, you know, when we're talking about pandemic response. Will the pandemic still be going in 2023? I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I have, you know, I, I have, I have you know, what's going on in the future. But what I can tell you is that, you know, everything that Do It has done, has been with the intention, I think successfully so, of standing up new systems, of supporting 
supporting a tremendous amount of infrastructure and making sure that we have the ability to respond quickly and to quickly stand up new emerging unexpected needs during during the pandemic, which is unfortunately still underway. Uh, local law 63 uh, requires that the mayor's office publish a plan detailing the anticipated contracting actions of each city agency for the upcoming fiscal year in certain categories of procurement. Um, this seems to indicate that the city is contracting out positions that could be filled by city employees. Uh, Mox, do you think that this chart indicates that uh, this work should be subject to local law 63 in the absence of an emergency? Uh, Victor, you are muted. We will unmute you. And I'm Thank going you. to you because I'm getting straighter answers from you. Thank you, Council Member. And in fairness, I do believe that that do it is try not answer your question. I have the wrong people. Honestly, uh, uh, so uh, in in the normal course of a procurement that would that would is not done pursuant to the COVID emergency powers, uh, as you know, we've talked about Local Law 63 several times. Uh, agencies will look at the job titles and headcount that are associated with the contract, and they will look to see if that work is overlapping in the contract that is contracted out for. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's displacement within the contract. There are several items that appear on an agency's plan where there are job titles and headcount. But as you know, Charter Section 312 and Local Law 63 is primarily concerned with whether or not there's displacement on an upcoming city contract. Thank you for the honest answer. We can have another hearing about what the definition of displacement is. Uh, but at least we got to have some common ground. Uh, so I'm going to direct folks to, uh, give me one second, I just have to. Pull the right document. On page 362 of the 3457 work order labeled IBM 001 MDM CR1 uh, we have four specialists. This isn't for Mox, this is for Do It Again. Mm -hmm. Specialists one, two, three, and four. Um, and it is for junior tester on site specialist two. It is at a rate of $215 an hour for 1,480 hours uh, for a total price of $318,000 or nine months for a total of $1.2 million. Um, are these people, are these, and this is for uh, BM, this is for VMware AirWatch Operation Staff Augmentation. Uh, are you familiar with this contract, with this work order? Uh, again, council member, we're going to have to follow up with you on, on that one. Um, I have my colleague here who's taking notes for me. So we're compiling a list of all the questions that we're going to have to follow up with you on after the hearing. I just want to make sure we get you the right accurate information. Uh, it's $1.2 million. Uh, upon information and belief, I believe these people are still working for you. Um, the Department of Information Technology and Communications actually advertised for a position of a VMware support engineer. Uh, it's currently actually up on your website right now. And it's for between $58,000 a year and $130,000 a year. Could uh, Associate Commissioner Robert Avalafia uh, would you be open to save the city several million dollars and go from paying the VMware specialists $300,000 a year through IBM to hiring city employees who can do the same work for between fifty-eight dollars and $130,000 a year? My, you know, my, my question was for Associate Commissioner Robert Abulafia. 
And I, I, I understand and appreciate that, but I, I understand and appreciate your question as well, council member, but I do want to note that my colleague would, you know, it, it does not oversee HR matters and would not be the one, you know, hiring for, for this type of position. So I don't think it would be fair for him to speculate on something that he doesn't, he doesn't work on uh, or oversee. Robert, in your job as Associate Commissioner for Procurement and Vendor Management, have you ever had occasion to insource a position? To, you're, you're saying to insource a position for procurement? So as you're looking at something and you say, wow, we're spending $300,000 on these roles and uh, we, can, we can hire this person for a lot cheaper. Have you ever had occasion to, to be involved in that? So council member, that, that does not fall under my purview. Um, you've talked a lot about industry standards. Uh, when you are managing a contract such as this, um, did you review how much we were paying a junior tester onsite specialist to, uh, to make sure that they conform to industry standards? <clears throat> As we, council member, as we mentioned in our testimony, um, the rates under the emergency contract are consistent with the existing uh, rates under the IBM systems integrator contract, which was uh, competitively procured. Do you think that $300,000 for a junior tester is a, is, a, is a good number? Do you think that that is what the market bears? Because if I go on Indeed right now, or any jobs board, and I type in VM Airwatch Operation Staff Augmentation, I'm going to get something like eighty to ninety thousand dollars a year to hire them straight in the private sector. We're offering one hundred fifty thousand, one hundred thirty thousand as a city agency. So, as mentioned previously, the the rates under the original IBM Systems Integrator contract were deemed fair and reasonable. Do you think who deemed them fair and reasonable? Um, this goes back to 2014. So it would really be the do it ACO at the time of 2014. Are you currently the do it ACO? Uh, no. What is your role for who, who is the do it ACO? Uh, the uh, do it ACO, his name is uh, John Joy. He's the acting ACO for the agency. Is John Joy able to join us? I believe that we were advised, correct me if I'm wrong, Council, that the ACO would actually be joining us for this hearing. Is that correct, Council? Uh, they didn't say ACO directly. They advised us of the uh, two do it reps who are currently here. Thank you. Uh, I'm corrected. Thank you for correcting me where I'm wrong. I don't mind being wrong. Sometimes it's a good surprise. Sure. Uh, my wife does it frequently, but I'm bump. Okay. Uh, so, as associate commissioner, are you able to tell an ACO when their numbers are completely off or are they a superior to you has power to fire, hire and fire you? So to, to go back to uh, what I was saying previously, the rates that were established under the IBM systems integrator contract were approved as fair and reasonable in 2014. So that predates either my uh, working at do it or um, acting echo joy is working into it. Have you ever had occasion to just say this number is too high and it should be renegotiated in your entire time at do it? Yes, absolutely. If we receive a rate. Amazing. That's good. What were the examples where you did? I guess one example would be a, a situation where we've conducted a, a large RFP um, and we um, found outliers in uh, some of the rates that were received and we would reach out to the vendor to negotiate lower rates. Amazing. Now that I've brought the VMware AirWatch operation staff augmentation goal to you, and the fact that we are paying them $318,000 for nine months. Is that a role you'd be open to considering uh, going back to the vendor and renegotiating that rate? 
that, that is a, a good question, Councilmember Kalos. <clears throat> I have to be very honest with you. I, I have not reviewed in great detail the uh, qualifications that are required for that title. So it's I would a really... VMware certificate that you can go online and get. It is a fairly low bar to entry. And in fact, I've been talking to large blue chip companies about uh, expanding the pool of folks, including to people who might be justice involved so that we can um, get these people who may not have a high school or even college degree, the certificates they need to do these jobs. Okay, so I, I greatly appreciate that information. Uh, but again, that is really something that we would want to discuss with our technical uh, leadership to get more context on. During the pandemic, did do it stay in person or did you go remote? Uh, do it was uh, generally remote. The role yeah. of junior tester was for on site. Um, you're paying $318,000 a year for four people to work on site. Do you know what site they were working at and whether or not they were in fact on site? or if we were paying for somebody to be on site who was actually remote. Council member, I clarify what my colleague just said. Uh, the vast majority of us were uh, remote working, but there are certain, uh, there were there are certain jobs that did require um, some of my colleagues to remain on site for the duration of the, of the pandemic. Uh, it wasn't the majority of our employees, but I believe there were a couple of, a couple of hundred folks who still had to come in, who still had to come in on every day because their job necessitated managing equipment and all that. This, this, it's VMware, so they're managing remote access. Um, my, my question is just whether or not you know if these four specialists were actually on site or not. <clears throat> Again, that, that's something we would need to get back to on. Would you agree that when you try to determine what the fair market is, do you take into account what the price is if you were to go on a job search board or even what you're currently offering city employees to do the same work? So as mentioned before, um, the, the rates that were established under this emergency contract um, are consistent with the existing rates that were um, that were in place under the do it uh, systems integrator contract, which was let through a competitive seal proposal process um, and the rates were determined to be fair and reasonable. When you did the competitive bid, it was at $33 million. Is that, that not $200 million, is that correct? So just to clarify, the $33 million task order was a, um, a sub procurement under this, the citywide system integrator contracts with IBM. And the emergency contract is a separate contract from that, yes. I am looking at work order amendments three, four, five, seven, and eight. And uh, in that document, we received 18 work orders. And on those 18 work orders, every single one of them has the same page three and four, uh, which has a chart on it. And that chart says critical infrastructure and security. It says the mission critical work stream and efforts identified address the following items, uh, critical infrastructure, application response to recovery for COVID-19, emergency response, data sharing, data-driven insight, insights for disaster recovery. Some of those items include network, core, mobile device management, security, detect and protect, 311, e-arraignment, data share, data bridge. Um, do you believe that by putting this boilerplate language on every single procurement and every single work order that that satisfies making it a COVID related emergency? <clears throat> so again, that, that's something we're gonna have to get back to on council member. We have to review this internally with our, our technical team. We were really sure. prepared about the emergency 
uh, procurement process uh, for this uh, year. Are you, are you saying that we're now talking about things that might not be emergency procurement? That's some no. of this procurement? No, I would not say that. Okay, so uh, there's this page, it's on every single thing. And so one of the questions we had is we saw that for the 301 contracts, it included this boilerplate language that includes something called e-arraignment. Um, in terms of the 301 work orders, was there any impact on the 301 work orders on e-arraignment? Uh, is there an e-arraignment component of 311 that was somehow missed missed in the other work orders and service requests in the MMR? I guess, why was e-arraignment included in the 301 uh, statements of work? That's something we'll have to check in on and get back to you on, council member. To, to be clear, everything you're saying is currently non-responsive. At, at this point, you've testified that you did not have personal knowledge. You testified to the names of the people who did have personal knowledge. And I just, at this point, don't feel that it is worth fighting with you on everything about it. Just please know that you're substantially non-compliant and uh, perhaps even in violation of the charter. Additionally, we have additional document requests that are outstanding. Uh, for instance, the, uh, uh, let's just throw into it. Uh, on your first, uh, IBM work order, do it dash IBM dash 001 dash MDM. Uh, the only things, sorry, it's, uh, it's the second work order. The first work order is for the VMware specialist. The second work order, do it dash IBM dash 002 slash science logic. Um, the only deliverables has output in the contract. So the only outputs from this contract are MS Word, Excel, MS Word, MS Word, MS Word, MS Word, and a roadmap. So I believe six out of seven deliverables on this contract, uh, which had a value of, I have two monitors, so that's why I'm squinting and looking at the other contract. Uh, Looking for the value. If anyone on the team remembers it off the top of their head, let me know. $511,000. So we spent half a million dollars on, I think, five Word documents. Um, Associate Commissioner Robert Avalafi, are you proficient in my mess word? Uh, I guess. I, I don't know how to respond to that, but I'll... I think the answer is yes. Anyone can use MS Word. We we graduated grade school and high school. We're good at it. So I guess the question is, we're we're asking them to create Word docs. This isn't create. This isn't software coding. This isn't network engineering. But we're paying three hundred and twenty-two dollars an hour uh, for technicians and technical people to draft Word documents and Excel documents and PowerPoints. And uh, we, we had requested copies of these documents and uh, uh, City Hall said that you would not be providing these documents. Um, have you seen any of these half million dollar documents? We were supposed to get a discovery report section of the assessment report, MS Word document of findings. Have any of you ever seen it? So was this part of the request that came in late last week? That's correct. We, we In reviewing the documents, the 1,800 pages of documents, we kept finding that documents were omitted and we kept submitting additional requests. So we figured you spent half a million dollars on these documents, you might be able to get your hands on them pretty quickly. So, you know, we are aware of document, additional document requests and we will uh, be responsive to that request. Do you, do you think that spending half a million dollars on a Word document is a good use of technical expertise? I, I really don't know the specifics of, of what is so involved. One of, the, one of the outputs is a quote, revised business requirements section of the assessment report, MS Word document of findings for do it proper. Uh, 
Science Logic Deployment Assessment and Gap Analysis and Science Logic Improvisation Plan, MS Word, Plan to Enhance Current Science Logic Implementation as Appropriate. It sounds like we actually ended up paying them half a million dollars to uh, basically give us a bid on the work they were going to do. And as far as I understand, usually we don't pay people to bid on our work. Do we, do we pay people to bid on our work? I guess that's a question. So, so we will provide a response to your document request and hopefully it'll provide some additional context that you're looking for. In the context of when you do an RFP, typically not emergency, and somebody is coming up with a scope of work in response to your RFP, do you pay them half a million dollars for that? Because as far as I understand, usually they pay us. So I, I don't know if I'm totally following your question. When we put out an RFP and say, we need somebody to build us an app, whatever it is, do we pay the people who are bidding? If five people are bidding, do we pay each of them for bidding on the project or do they have to eat that expense? I believe Victor is trying to, to weigh in on this. Victor. Thanks, council member. Yep. So I, I, I just want to reiterate something that I think um, we all know, but might be lost here is that do it like every other agency was responding to the pandemic in real time. And so things that would normally occur, and I haven't reviewed any of the specifics of this contract, but generally speaking, in, in the work that I was a part of, uh, there were lots of things that agencies would typically undertake on their own. Uh, that were done in collaboration with vendors. So for example, the city usually sources all of its own material, it finds its own vendors. When the global supply chain broke down, we hired a vendor to help us find vendors to source the PPE that we needed. The, typically, the city would typically never pay for that type of service, but under the circumstances, we needed help with doing things that we normally would have done. Um, I imagine that Do It at various times throughout the pandemic found itself in similar situations and was looking for help in doing things that it might normally be able to do under normal circumstances by itself. Just to offer some context for how things were going in the heat of the pandemic and, and you know, when everyone was trying to figure out just how to keep the lights on in the city functioning. I appreciate that, but I guess while I have you, Victor, do we typically pay vendors to bid on our RFPs? Well, in the normal course of the procurement process, no, the city will put out a solicitation and then vendors will submit a proposal that's evaluated and scored by the city and whoever scores the best is, is the vendor that's awarded the contract. Victor, I guess the overall question and, and I had asked the associate commissioner this, but like whose job is it to make sure that we're not spending $300,000 through a contractor and somebody we could hire for $50,000 directly. Sure, and, and we trust the judgment of Do It and its leadership in properly evaluating its contract to ensure that the work that it's contracting out for is necessary. Um, you know, and I, I have confidence that they're doing that throughout the course of this contract. Um, there are questions that you've asked that uh, Mr. Abalafia and, uh, and, and Robin uh, forgive me, I don't remember your last name, but, but might not be able to uh, answer, but it doesn't mean that do it doesn't have reasonable answers to the questions that you're asking. And, and this is not also to say that the questions that you're asking are unreasonable. I think that, uh, that it just might require some follow up response that they're not able to provide on this at this hearing. So I guess, speaking abstractly, uh, whether it's city time, whether it's this, whether it's another contract. So we had an entire hearing with you and DCAS around, we, we, we tried to buy uh, aprons, uh, COVID aprons, when people were wearing bunny suits at the beginning, we spent $100 million on it on ballparking and just trying to vaguely remember. And so I questioned Mercita about, I was like, how much money did we spend? How much did we get back? And I think it ended up being like, we got $80 million back on the contract and things like that. But like, um, it sounded like DCAS was really on top of it. If, if DCAS had dropped the ball, what, who steps in when, if, if they, they, when things go wrong? 
So, so was did Mercedes do it all alone at DCAS or who, who steps in when the emergency contracts go wrong because we don't have the oversights, we don't have the protections and like fraud happens and theft happens and overbilling happens. Yeah, so, so I would say it's always been, this is one of the things that we're proud of. It's always been a collaborative effort. Uh, we talked about this last time, but, but there have been virtually no instances of fraud in the cities over $7 billion worth of purchases uh, in response to the pandemic, there were a few contracts well, well, you that caught it. Us. You, caught, you caught them. Like we, we didn't lose the money, but you, you caught the. Well, fraud. we also have the. Well, we have the services that were paid for. We have the goods that were bought. We have the vaccine sites that were stood up. We have the testing sites that were operational. I mean, we do have other confirmed proof that we got what it is that we paid for. Uh, there were a few instances where we were promised things such as ventilators. Uh, while working in the gray market at the very height and beginning of the pandemic where vendors were unable to perform. And we involved the city's law department to help us to recover that money and to take the appropriate legal action. And some cases were referred to the federal government for prosecution um, So and, and state government as well. So there, there are oversights that are in place to ensure that we're receiving the services that we need. And I think that by and large, the city's response to the pandemic has been extraordinarily successful. Sure. Um... I, I think I may have frozen for a moment. I'm not sure if you asked me a question. Alex, are you are you still? Yeah, I'm here? still here, Victor. I think actually we lost the chair. Oh, okay. I'm glad it's not me. I was just checking to make sure that I wasn't frozen. Um, I'm going to say hold for a moment until the chair returns. Oh, sure. he's back. Okay. Thank you. If I can be promoted to co-chair, sorry about that. I uh, have way too many windows open. Uh, I guess both to Mox and to Associate Commissioner Abulafia, uh, I brought up a lot of examples. Do I have a commitment from one or both of you to actually go through this with a fine tooth comb, look at the salaries, look at the differences between what do its hiring at versus what we're paying IBM and trying to control costs on this project and in source and do as much of the work ourselves as possible. Now that we're all getting our triple boost vaccines and pretty much hopefully coming out of this pandemic and this emergency. We're happy to take a look at the contract with Do It. Amazing, uh, Director Olds, amazing. And Associate Commissioner. Yes, we have we have a number of follow ups um, to address after this call. And uh, as always, we will work with Mox to address anything that needs to be addressed. So I'm going to for fear that other things might get missed. So we talked about science logic um, on your fourth contract. Do it dash IBM 004 dash auto dash one dash two. In the work orders, it, pays, it appears the city paid one point five million dollars for one PowerPoint two PDFs and some sample YML code. Um, do you know if there was any technical work done? So I believe the, the cost that you're referring to along uh, also includes the services required for those tasks. But we would, if you can provide us, um, if you can provide us a specific section, we will take a look at that and get back it's, to you. It's IBM 004 auto 1 2. I got it from you. Um, what I would say is um, this was for you to set up a Red Hat Ansible automation platform. And so that's a lot of jargon there. So let me just simplify it for everybody. Red Hat is a platform like Linux, and uh, Linux is like Microsoft, off, uh, Microsoft Windows 10. So whether you're running your computer on Windows 10 or on Mac OS, or you're running it on Linux, it's an operating system. And Ansible Automation Platform is what folks who work at your office, if you work in an office anywhere, there's been a time where they're like, leave your computer on tonight because they're going to do a major update and you're going to go from Windows uh, 8 to Windows 10 tonight. So when you come in, make sure all your documents are wiped, yada, yada, yada. This is that, but 
for Linux. And so I guess the big question is, was there any technical work done? Uh, what did IBM actually do here? How many servers are we actually talking about? And um, why not just have one of your own sysadmins set up the Ansible system? <clears throat> yeah, we will provide responses on all of those questions. Okay, J just to like put it in, in perspective, like, hold on, let me just grab my pocket. So like, this, this is my keychain. This is my, my Linux server. I can literally plug it into any computer and run my own platform. So like setting up Ansible is something I could literally do and it would not take me $1.2 million worth, $1.5 million worth of time to do it. Um, work order number 11, uh, we paid $224,000 for a cloud engineer. Uh, right now, do it is hiring a senior cloud engineer for $145,000. Uh, is there a reason why we can't use a, use one of your senior cloud engineers and save $100,000? Yeah, as my, sorry, uh, council member, thank you for the question. Um, as my uh, colleague, Robin Levine, um, mentioned earlier, you know, we are not, uh, we are not overseeing the HR function at the agency. Um, so, you know, that is a question we would need to take back in regards to the um, qualifications required for uh, that title as compared to what uh, DOIT is receiving through the IBM contract. If you go to careers at DOIT, so again, that's NYC, uh, I don't know if you're able to open it on your computer, nyc.gov slash site slash DOIT slash about slash careers dot page there's something like 90 positions there um is do it amidst the hiring freeze i'm sorry you asked uh, you asked about a hiring freeze um uh, neither neither of us um <clears throat> oversee hr uh so i don't i don't want to misspeak here but i understand that our team works with with OMB on on um, <clears throat> on eligible on eligible hires, but again, I'm I'm sorry, council member. I know this is frustrating for you, and you know I'm happy to commit to getting you um, you know answers in writing. Is there a reason why the dep the, the chief operations officer or why the commissioner was afraid to show up and answer these questions today? Would they have been able to answer these questions? I apologize, Council Member. I think we, um, I, I think we accidentally got muted. Um, again, Council Member, you know, our understanding is that this was uh, an oversight hearing broadly on emergency procurement during the pandemic, and as such, uh, our we felt it would uh, produce our associate commissioner for procurement and vendor management to, to speak about procurement, but I, I understand um, that you have a lot of technical questions. I, I know that you're going through all of the documents that we sent you. And so I, I understand your line of questioning and I certainly appreciate it. And like I said, I can commit to getting you answers in writing, but to the extent that you have these technical questions about the technical work that was going on, that, that's something that we're going to have to get back to you on. What does do it stand for? Uh, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. And so like you guys do technical work? Yes. I'm, I'm a council member, like what I'm not, we're, we're not, we're not known for being the most technical people on the planet. Um, in looking at the job postings, you've got something like 90 job postings. Um, some of them go back to 2019. Do you believe your your agency would be better suited uh, to have taken on this pandemic without having to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on contracts if you had fully staffed up and had the in-house talent to take on a lot of the challenges 301 was facing? Uh, as I said earlier, council member, our top priority 
was making sure that we were able to put into action COVID response as quickly as possible. And so we were able to leverage this IBM contract to do just that um, and, and help New Yorkers during the, during the pandemic, which is still going on. So uh, somebody from my team points out, you keep saying that you didn't know that this was gonna be about IBM. I'm, I'm looking at your testimony, which is five pages long. And um, aside from an a brief introduction for yourself and the associate commissioner, uh, everything in this document from that on forward is about the IBM contract. Is that uh, correct? Well, I don't, I don't think there's ever any doubt that we were here to talk about the IBM emergency contract. Okay, great. We're on the same page again. Uh, with regards to the uh, cloud engineer, uh, we talked about that one. Um, so work order number 12, and I'll throw this open to both of you. Uh, let me just pull the right page, page 157. So near as I can tell from work order number 12, uh, it appears to be nothing more than paying IBM to actually bill us. Uh, this was a contract that was issued in uh, May of 2020 and um, we literally, one of the items on page 160 two is we are paying IBM to quote, sign off time sheets in a timely manner, but at least within three working days after submission of the time sheets. So um, I guess to, to Director Olds, um, I've, I've advocated alongside Mox for years to cover overhead. Um, is the city now in a situation where we will actually cover costs for for-profit and non-profit providers to do timesheets directly hourly? I, I haven't reviewed uh, any of the work orders that you're referring to, so happy to circle back with do it and take a look at what, what each of the work orders uh, entailed. I guess, uh, Director Olds, have, have you ever seen a, a contract where the city was paying for somebody else to go through their own employees timesheets? I imagine that it's part of a broader scope of work, but again, without having seen that work order specifically or what's referenced or what was intended in it, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I, I'd rather circle back with Dude and better understand what that work order was intended to convey. Uh, another item on the contract was uh, uh, reviewing, I reviewing with review quote review with IBM any invoice or billing requirement. Is that typically a bill for activity? Again, uh, I think we'd have to talk to do it about what was intended in that work order. Um, Mox doesn't review or sign off on work orders. I mean, those are specific to every contract, so we haven't seen these and happy to talk to do it about uh, what was encompassed within the work orders. Sure. Um, over to, to do it. Uh, do you frequently pay vendors to the time it takes for them to check their own timesheets for their employees? Again, council member, uh, to, to, um, to the point that um, my colleague at Mox just made, uh, we really, I really, I really would, like to circle back with our team here to get you all ne necessary context here. I, I don't want to speak. I don't want to misspeak on this. Um, and so, as I said, you know, it, we're happy to, you know, to get back to you in writing on on all on all of these questions. But I, you know, I just want to confer with my colleagues so I can get you as much context as is necessary. So, so this that. contract cost us one point. Two five million dollars. The least expensive person on this is a PMO analyst, a junior scrum master, project manager. We are paying two hundred and twenty dollars an hour, and so we're paying somebody two hundred and twenty dollars an hour to sign off on timesheets in a timely manner. 
to review with IBM any invoice or billing requirement. Just if, if, you, if you call to dispute a bill, whether it was with uh, your cable company, your phone company, or even an attorney, like what would you do if they billed you for the time it took to dispute your bill? Rob, what, what would you do if somebody billed you to, you call time, you, you call your cable company and you say you are over billing me uh, you're, you're supposed to charge me ninety dollars. You're charging me one twenty, and they're like, eh, "It's going to cost you five hundred dollars for you to dispute this bill." Um, you know, I, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals, council member. But again, you know, I'm happy to follow up with the team and get back to you, and get back to you on this. And and we've been on this for now three and a half hours. None of your team members are able to join this. Uh, this hearing? I've got all day, I've got all night. Um, as, as I said, council member, I understand your line of questioning. I, I know where you're going. I, like, I, I understand and appreciate your line of questioning and I'm happy to follow up with my team. I'm happy to get you written responses. I know you said that you don't always get written responses, but if you talk to Chair Holden, you know, we, we are very good about follow up. So I wanna make sure the that- The only thing I really want from you is a letter saying, that we've exposed some inconsistency in the contracting process and that you're that you're going to go through the regular contracting process on this, that we're going to uh, cancel the 120 something million dollar, 122.4 million dollar contract and that we're going to actually like get the cost down, do it in house and get this competitively bid so we can get the cost down and save taxpayer money. That, that's all I really want. That's what I've asked for since August. Like I, I pay taxes, all of us do, and it feels like it's being wasted to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. And it seems like I don't have anybody here who is responsible for making sure that there's cost controls. It sounds like the people who do the cost controls didn't feel that it was their job to show up. It wasn't their job to manage the contract. It's not their job to show up to an oversight hearing. <laughs> Um, this oversight hearing was about the IBM contract and the contract is basically work orders. Now it sounds from everyone that has testified that none of you have reviewed the work orders prior to this hearing. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. So you did review the work orders. Yeah. I mean, we, we have been preparing uh, for the hearing for the last few days. Um, we haven't had a ton of time due to the holidays, but we have done our best to review all the documentation, which is significant, as you know. I think the best thing to do would have been to bring people who could answer the questions. Um, let's move on to work order number four. It's do it dash IBM dash zero zero five dash D I N I Dinny page 54. What kind of work does Dinny do? And I, I reserve that right to, uh, for a, uh, song title. That is a Paul and Storm reference for those of you who like Jonathan Coulton, a Brooklyn based artist. They are most famous for a song called We Are the Opening Band. I can't tell if anyone out here is cracking a smile. So, so we have to get back to you on that specific uh, work order. Obviously, there's uh, some technical context that we would need to review. Is Denny in MWBE? Uh, I don't believe so, no. That is correct. Uh, they are hiring, uh, they are on contract for hyperconvergent engineers. Um, do you know what a hyperconvergent, hyperconverged engineer is? I didn't uh, know what they were either. <laughs> um, I, I Googled it. Um, that is my answer for every time I say the word Google, my phone goes off, by the way. Uh, so when it comes to the hyperconvergent engineer, 
when I Googled it, uh, it basically just says that like they set up boxes that show up pre-configured. Um, do it has been advertising uh, positions for hyperconvergent engineers. You were paying through Dini $244.25 uh, for a hyperconverged engineer to the tune of $219,000, but you are also advertising this position for $100 per hour. Um, is it possible that we could save $200,000 by bringing it in-house? Again, council member, we hear your concerns about, um, about utilizing in-house in -house folks. And as, as I said, um, I'm happy to follow up with my technical colleagues here and get you a, a, response, in, a, a, a response in writing. On, on all of this, but uh, I don't think Robert or myself can speak to the, the, the technical specifics of, of the requirements for that, that role or, or the, the scope of that work. Uh, let's talk about the COVID recovery app. When we first asked about this $200 million increase, we were told it was all the COVID recovery app. Uh, the city's put out multiple COVID apps. Um, how many, so there's a COVID recovery app in this and there's a COVID safe app. Can you tell me the difference between the two? Uh, I can tell you that the NYC COVID safe app is, uh, it has, as of Thanksgiving, there were over 1 million people who downloaded it. And I'm, I'm pulling it up on my phone right now because I myself use it. NYC COVID safe is a way for people to um, provide proof of vaccination without having, so, um, oh, excuse me, my, don't show everyone your birthday. It's fine. I got it. So, okay. uh, so, the, so the NYC COVID Safe app, to your question, is a way for people to provide proof of vaccination. You can upload a photo of your vax card, of, of your photo ID, and also test status. Um, and one of the advantages of this app is unlike the Excelsior Pass, which requires people to have been vaccinated within New York State, anyone can take a photo of their of their vax card. So I know that a lot of tourists use it. I know it's something that's been widely um, utilized in New York City. Like I said, as of Thanksgiving, over a million folks had downloaded that app. Uh, how much did it cost to build the uh, COVID Safe app? Um, uh, I, I believe it was a few hundred thousand dollars. I, I mean, for context, I'm pretty sure the Excelsior Pass cost in the in the millions. I think MIC COVID Safe was a couple of hundred thousand dollars. I don't have the precise figure, but we're adding a list of things to follow up with you on. Council. On page 428 for do it ibm 048 recovery app cr one. Uh, the number that we have is $647,754.54. Does that sound accurate? I, um, I, I, I think so. But again, I'll verify that with my team after the hearing. But I think that's probably the, the ballpark figure. And so the Excelsior Pass was announced on March 26, 2021, when it in fact went live, uh, this work order uh, went into effect on March 29th, 2021, three days after Governor Cuomo had originally already launched a working Excelsior app. Uh, whose idea was it to, for the city to build their own app? The NYC COVID safe is responsive specifically to the needs of New Yorkers. At, at that time, um, I, I believe that uh, city employees had to provide um, proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test within, I, I believe it was 72 hours. Um, and so the, the COVID Safe app was built specifically to be responsive to the needs of of New York City residents, but also New York City workforce. Um, and I know that the Excelsior Pass uh, did not have some of the same functionality that we needed to provide New York City employees. Who ordered it? Who, who asked for it? Was it the Duet Commissioner? Was it Mayor de Blasio himself? Was it Chokshi? Was it 
Office of Labor Relations? Was it uh, a council member raising their hand and saying, I want you to build this now, even though we have the Excelsior app? My understanding that this was a this was a director from City Hall, yes. City Hall is in Mayor de Blasio, City Hall is in a deputy mayor. Um, uh, my understanding is that that this is something that came from the highest leadership at City Hall. I guess when you look at the app, there are four screens. There's the primary screen. There is a placeholder for hold, storing an image for your COVID card. There's a placeholder for storing your ID. And I believe there is a placeholder for storing any test results that you take a picture. Essentially, you're, you're talking about a photo favorites app, which is uh, be, before the, the COVID safe app came out, I just favorited a photo of my COVID card in my album which did not cost 600,000. Um, is there a reason why it costs so much money to essentially favor three photos, which is a feature found on iPhones and Androids? Again, I, I, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna to get too into the weeds on the technical components because as you know, I'm, I'm not a technical person, but I understand that, uh, the, that the app was produce, you know, uh, for several hundred thousand dollars. I know the Excelsior Pass, I think, was more in the range of millions. And again, um, as far as the functionality of the app, I, as we talk about economic recovery and and bringing New York City back as vibrant as ever, you know, I, I think you, I, I think we all can appreciate how important tourism is. And I know that for tourists, this app has really been helpful because um, there are, you know, people who were not, who, people who were vaccinated outside of New York State are able to, you know, quickly just have a place to, um, uh, to upload their VAX card, their photo ID, all of that at a glance without having to either go through their camera roll, carry a card around, you know, pull out their photo ID, all, all of that. So, so the simple, the simplicity, I think, is what makes it so accessible to, to folks, uh, including folks who may not be as tech savvy as yourself. Sure. Are there any other emergency contracts like IBM out there? I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you put out any other emergency contracts? We, we have a number of emergency contracts that were required to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, yes. Can you tell me about them? We can, we can send you a, a list uh, to, to be responsive um, and add that to the many lists of follow-ups that we have. You, uh, do it has been testifying all day that you were prepared for it hearing on emergency procurement in addition to IBM, is there anything else out there that's as big as the IBM contract for $200 million? So again, like, like I just said, we will have to go back and provide you with a comprehensive list of, of all our emergency contracts. And from there, you could gauge whether there's a similar contract. Is there a public place where I could find such a list of emergency contracts? Uh, this, this know, is, I'll throw this to Mox. Yeah. <clears throat> so all the contracts that were registered uh, by Mox should be visible in checkbook, but we're happy to follow up and provide you with uh, an, an easy to use uh, spreadsheet that has a list of all the COVID emergency contracts. I might know my way around checkbook NYC. But just in case it's difficult to navigate what emergency contracts are COVID related or just general emergency contracts, we have a list that we shared with the controller's office that has a list of every COVID emergency contract that we registered. Uh, both a question for Dewitt and Mox. Has the controller's office looked at any of the things that I brought up and asked any of these questions? Have you heard anything from the controller on this? I'm not aware of any specific conversations around this. Uh, IBM contract, but but I, I I can check at the staff level to see if there have been uh, questions that have been lobbed over the fence. And, and I would just add to that, um, 
we have provided all uh, contract documentation to the controller's office as per their request. So they have all that information. So on Checkbook NYC, um, actually, I, I, Victor, I will take you up on it because while we're answering the question, I went to Checkbook NYC, I did an advanced search. Uh, there is now an option on the advanced search for um, for a, a emergency and it has a COVID-19 drop down, which is kind of scary because we're foreseeing that there's going to be more under catastrophic event. There might be more. Um, and when I did a search for it, it came up with $1.1 trillion in spending. So that's quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and just a reminder, we don't manage the checkbook website that that's managed by the controller's office. So we have our own. I, separate I, I, I got you. I got you. Uh, so uh, a question is, um, Associate Commissioner uh, Robert Avalafia, are you familiar with a contract with uh, MTX B2B Solutions LLC? Uh, yes. Uh, how much was the original contract? So we, we did not prepare to talk about that contract for this hearing. Um, the IBM contract was specifically named um, as something that we would need to prepare for. Um, you know, if you have a specific question. I'm about to ask a bunch of them. So I guess what's a little bit unfair is everything I kept asking about the statements of work was like, we'll get back to you. We lack the expertise, so on and so forth. And uh, we, we were talking about emergency procurement generally, but at the same time, you're like, well, we're only prepared to talk about the IBM contract. But I would just say, you really haven't given me any answers on the IBM contract other than how much it was. Uh, so MTX B2B Solutions, you have a contract. According to Checkbook NYC, uh, that contract is for $45.9 million. That was your initial contract amount. I would love to share the screen, but if you're following along at home uh, or if you're at it, if you type in uh, MTX B2B Solutions LLC, you can pull up their contract. Uh, the contract number that you want is CT1858202140. If you type that in, it'll give it to you. So the original contract was for $45.9 million starting on May 9th, 2020. Uh, that is an emergency contract. Uh, do you know if that was a no bid contract? So again, we, we did not uh, prepare to discuss other emergency contracts. Well, if it's um, an emergency yeah. contract, it's no good, right? No, we, we complied with all of the requirements under the emergency executive the, the order. The requirement to have competing bids was waived as part of the executive order, which you have read to me <laughs> so, less than five times, so correct? Just, a, just a, a point of clarification. Um, Competition was not required in the traditional sense, but agencies, uh, to the extent that it was practicable, were able to uh, inquire of other vendors to, to see who was best suited to provide services. So in some instances, as needs were urgent, agencies went to vendors who they knew could provide services. In other instances, and this is citywide, agencies were able to conduct some form of competition to see who was best suited for the contract. Love the straightforward, honest answer. So would love to know uh, from Do It if you actually asked anybody else or if you just gave it to MTX B2B Solutions. So again, we you know did not come to this hearing to talk about um, that contract. You know we we prepared to talk about the IBM emergency contract. Um, so if you you know if you have specific questions, we can take. Well, that I back. do. Would you believe me if I told you that according to Checkbook NYC, the new contract amount is $191.7 million? Yes, I believe you. Okay. Um, and that the new deadline for this contract is May 8th, 2023. And back to, to, to Mox, if this was no longer an emergency contract and the additional $140 million was put out as a regular RFP process bid, would it still be marked as an emergency award? If, if the agency resolicited and went through the normal procurement process? 
Sorry, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Uh, just that it is safe to assume that based on the fact that the contract is still marked emergency, that the additional $140 million that was added to the $150 million, give or take, that was added was added through the emergency process, not through the regular process. Yeah, without, without having the contract in front of me, if it's marked as a COVID emergency, I imagine that it went through the COVID emergency process. Uh, happy to confirm that, but I- Yes, that, please. Um, so we've got two emergency contracts. They come out to $380 million, just shy of $400 million. We're no longer talking about hundreds of thousands. We're no longer talking about hundreds of millions. We're now closer to billions than millions. And the purpose of the contract is the COVID-19 emergency purchase contact tracing SW solution. Um, now, test and trace has been operating for 18 months now. Uh, there were more than $2 million in payments just in November. Do you know what we're paying for at this point? Shouldn't these, the, the software for test and trace be like settled by now? So we could we could take a look into your um, your question and get back to you on that. This contract only has spending of forty nine point three million as of today, according to Checkbook NYC. Uh, even though they have one hundred ninety one million to spend over the next two years, can we put this out to bid and save one hundred and fifty million dollars? Is is the assumption that the work is not required? I, I don't understand. I mean, we're talking about systems that are necessary to respond to COVID-19, um, which was a very time sensitive, urgent need. Do you believe that during an emergency, during a pandemic, during a time where you can't go through the regular bidding process? So do you believe that going through an RFP process and competition can lead us to getting better deals? I think that in a normal situation, um, yes, an RFP process is the best route in accordance with, you know, just normal best practices. But the reality is that this was far from a normal situation. This was an and so I'm stipulating that there's $50 million on both contracts that we're probably not getting back. But moving forward, there's $280 million. That is the cost of 3K for every child in New York City. That is the cost of pre-K for every child in New York City. That is the cost of building thousands of school seats. That is the, that, that is, that is the cost of, I think, um, it, it, is, it is so much money. And so the, the question is, do you think that if we went out with an RFP, we might be able to pay less than 240 or $300 an hour for positions that you're currently hiring at 100 an hour? Again, council member, to go back to what I said at the beginning of the hearing several hours ago, um, the, the full RFP process would take would take an entire year. And in regards to emergency contracts, these are two and three year contracts. We could keep the emergency contract. We could pay out another $50 million and do an RFP and possibly still save $100 million moving forward. We might be able to hire these people in house. Without so council member, council member, as mentioned previously, these contracts are registered to establish contract capacity. The specific work that is being performed is memorialized under approved work orders. So the actual amount spent under the contract may end up, end up being significantly less. The idea is that we allow for enough capacity to cover the unpredictable need uh, that the city might face due to the pandemic. We're two years into a pandemic. Do you feel like you can kind of predict what's happening and how we're doing vaccinations and the types of needs we need? And well, I mean, the state the state declared an emergency yesterday, correct? Have we been through that before? So, you know, I, I can't say that I can predict what's going to happen in the future. There's this new variant that is a tremendous threat. Was there a previous variant that was a threat? Did we have a well, variant before this one? Just to just to interject, I I think I think what um, what Mr. Abalafi is is trying to convey is that uh, none of us thought that we would be in the position that we're in today at the start of the pandemic, and we're all trying to be responsible about the actions that we take going forward in the future. I, I think that 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 is 
the interest that you have as a council member, that's the interest that we have on the city side, uh, certainly here at Mox, and I'm sure at Do It, and everyone is doing their best to act responsibly to ensure that New York City uh, inhabitants are, are as safe as possible. These are responsible to pay people that we could pay $50,000, $300,000 through a contractor. Well, I think that, that it's, this isn't uh, you, this is to do it. Like, it's just. So, you know, I, I just, it's, this is a hypothetical question. No, uh, it's not... like we brought up multiple instances where we were paying three to four times more, even six times more to, to pay for somebody at IBM to do it instead of a city employee who we could hire for like a fraction of the cost. You know, again, to go back to what I've said previously, we would need to really review the qualifications that are required for that work as compared to the qualifications that are posted for that specific title, because there definitely is a difference to it. Do you, do you know why the MTX B2B Solutions LLC did not show up in the local Law 18 report? I, I'd have to... That question. I'd have to... Yeah, I, I'd have to. Yeah, sure. I, I'd have to review that. My my team is extraordinarily careful about uh, what goes into these reports, and so happy to. I have full confidence that we uh, excluded it for a valid reason. Um, I think the valid reason is and, this was an expense contract, not a capital contract. Well, that well, that's and, why. I that's think case, do it. I think do it used capital money on IBM, and when they put this out. There, there is very little question in my mind that if they're paying for contract tra tracing software, that that is COVID related. And it would be hard to shoehorn in things that aren't COVID related to contracts. But don't, don't, I, we will be asking for the same level of documentation on this contract as the other. But um, if you have other examples of contracts that I've seen this much growth, we'd really like to see it. Um, off question, I don't know if this is a DCAT, still a DCAS problem or not. Uh, do we have anyone on city time left who hasn't been brought in house? Are we still paying consultants to maintain and manage city time? So when I was GovOps chair for the previous four years, we made sure that we got rid of every single contractor on city time. Does do it do any work on city time? Did you eat that as well as through managed by uh, OPA? That's my understanding. Okay. Do you think that city time is a good model in terms of getting rid of all the consultants to reduce $600 million in costs and bring costs in so that we're not paying consultants five to 10 times more? Again, council member, respectfully, I think you've made your point to do it. Um, uh, we hear what you're saying. We, we, hear, your, we hear your concerns. Uh, we hear the questions that you're raising, and we're happy to we're, we're happy to get to, we're happy to get back to you on, on specific questions about the procurements, about the contracts, about the work orders, and get you all of that um, get you all of all of those written responses. Sure. Uh, get us the written responses. We've already requested a lot of documents. We want those documents. We want the answers. Uh, if we do not receive the documents, I've issued subpoenas before. I will issue them for the documents. If we do not get the answers in the documents uh, from the people who have the answers, we will issue subpoenas for the people to reappear before this committee. Uh, I'm going to excuse, we, we may also send additional questions as they arise. Uh, I'm going to excuse this administrative panel and I'm hoping that we do have uh, DC 37 still waiting to testify. I don't know if we have anyone left to testify. Um, unfortunately, it appears we do not, Chair. Uh, okay. the, yeah, we do not. I want to thank uh, Mox for uh, being a part of this and to, for answering the questions incredibly honestly. Uh, and. Uh, Thank you, and uh, we'll continue looking into this. I hereby adjourn this year. Thank you.